several uh, questions that were answered as part of our um, next steps. And um, but I think we're going to start with Dr. Braybrands. He had a, he had a budget suggestion, and this is going to provide details on the restraint and seclusion um, portion of his suggested budget ask. Budget ask. Well, we just no, we just finished. So, just to center everybody, we we thank you for seeing everybody uh, coming back two day uh, two days in one week to do budget. Um, I do want to just. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I have to do one thing first, which is we have to certify closed. Oh, yeah. I apologize. In order to comply with Section 2.2.3712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for the Board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on May 2, 2019, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the Board during the closed meeting. Do I have a motion? Motion made by Ms. Hines, seconded by Ms. Keyes Gamara. All those in favor? That's Ms. Evans, Ms. Hines, Ms. Keyes Gamara, Ms. Darinak Kofax, Ms. Strauss, uh, Mr. Moon, Mr. Wilson, and away from the table are Ms. Palchek um, and Ms. Schultz. Those and Ms. McLaughlin. Those opposed? And Mr. McElveen. Uh, and Mr. McElveen. Oh my goodness! One, two. We have seven, so that motion passes. Let's continue on. I apologize, Dr. Broybrand. Uh, no problem at all. Um, I just want to set the stage. Monday we had a work session on the budget. You all began to discuss and got to see the budget amendments. You got to look at the follow-on motions with implications that had budget implications for FY20's budget um, and beyond. Um, there was also a piece where we had a placeholder around uh, uh, restraint and seclusion. Many of you said that that was an important priority for you. So one of the things I wanted to do this evening is provide for you an update on um, elements from the work session on that that you requested in terms of what we've done. That also includes some costing. Uh, that we've done and some preliminary placeholder recommendations that we had as you remember that we had TBD in there and some of you Wanted that fleshed out just a little bit more and we have a little bit for you on that. I want to assure you That what we would share tonight is an, uh, an update from that work that we did at the work session and some preliminary recommendations but not included in any of what you're going to see this evening is going to be recommendations that would relate to the independent review that we are doing around restraint and seclusion or the task force that we are about to set up and get their input and recommendations um, that could have additional budget impacts next year and we stand ready to work to address recommendations from that outside council and from the task force at a future time but that is not what's on the table for tonight. Um, we don't want to cost out long-term solutions before we've done the work of that task force or the outside independent review is conducted. Um, we do need to move forward uh, and we need to move forward in an aggressive fashion around this work of restraint and seclusion practices. Um, and we wanted to have a little bit tonight to show you that we are making some good first steps to move the system forward in a caring and inclusive way. We recognize that healing does need to happen. And so we wanna make sure as you all are even doing these fi final amendments that we have restraint and seclusion as part of the conversation. Um, we have all the next steps from Monday all complete as well. And we'll have that available for you to discuss as you move into that budget discussion. And I look forward to helping you in any way I can as you all really talk about the priorities that you want to see um, with the remaining six million dollars in staffing initiatives that we identified. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask the Assistant Superintendent of uh, Special Services, Teresa Johnson, to begin. Okay, thank you Dr. Brabrand. On Monday, a request was made uh, for an update on the work that is in progress on the plan presented at the April 2nd work session. 
Our outreach efforts began right after the April 2nd work session. Dr. Brabrand and Department of Special Services staff met with the ACSD on April 10th, where we reviewed the restraint and seclusion presentation that was presented to the board on April 2nd. We are currently in the process of scheduling a meeting with the special education PTA to include the outgoing president and the incoming president who was just elected this week. Also this week, a communication was sent out to various organizations inviting them to participate on the special education community task force. We are currently gathering names from those organizations and contact information so we can confirm a date, a meeting date in June and also a location. We have engaged targeted principals for feedback of what they believe their needs are to support students. For your awareness, the number one request was additional behavior intervention teachers. Uh, Dr. Duran will discuss a little more about the ombudsman's position, uh, the special education specialist position in a few, a few minutes. This position is pending school board approval on May 9th. Our outside legal review is in process. And the review of elementary comprehensive services sites and public day programs began this week. We expect these reviews to be completed by the end of May. Regarding strategic auditing of schools, we are completing data entry for all data that's been collected beginning with 2012 data, uh, 2012 data. We expect this data entry to be completed by June 30th, 2019. The Departments of Information Technology and Special Services, are, the work group has been meeting to complete the electronic data collection process. Uh, the data collection tab has been completed in the student information system, and the work group is now developing our processes and training that we expect to roll out, uh, to complete and roll out for administrators in August. On our next slide, as part of our next steps, uh, it was requested that we share the costs of the plan presented in the April 2nd work session. The top chart shows costing from the April work session. The first column lists positions and items, then the number of positions, if applicable, and the cost, then the status. The bottom chart lists preliminary placeholder recommendations for three additional behavior intervention teachers to support all the pyramids and the estimated training costs for staff the majority of that would be crisis management programs such as the uh, PCM and the MANT training in addition to substitute coverage. We anticipate needing additional funding after we see the results, uh, as Dr. Brabrand mentioned, after we see the results of the, re the outside review from the outside council and recommendations that may come from the special education community task force. We will, we expect to come back to the board to ask for additional funding. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Duran. As Ms. Johnson said, on uh, February 9th, we, have, we will have for school board approval the creation on, of an assistant ombudsman to work in the ombudsman office. Um, just a little bit of background on that. Um, first of all, we will be coming to you at um, the end of the year with a full report on the ombudsman office and all the work that's happened. But just as it relates to the issue we're talking about this evening, uh, up to, to this point, we've had 322 total contacts uh, into the Ombudsman Office, and 29% of them have been related to special education. So we clearly see that a third of the issues that are coming into the Ombudsman Office, and you've seen this in your quarterly reports. You should be getting one, I believe, next week. We've been providing quarterly reports that are disaggregated based upon who is making the report and the type of issue that they're reporting on. So given that 30% of the cases that we see are related to special education, we do see that there would be a great need and to support to have an additional position that would assist in those issues. What might that position do? We, we do see two main areas. We would have an increased focus and expertise. So the primary responsibility of this additional position would be to support parents with special education concerns. And we would make sure that we would have an individual who has greater knowledge and experience in special education process, so who we hire, having that expertise. The second way that this position would support the office and parents and community is being able to provide a greater level of support. Currently, when parents and community contact the Ombudsman Office, we offer strategies, we provide answers to questions, we direct them to the appropriate offices, and we follow up to make sure that they're getting that support. But with this additional support, we can go above and beyond that. We would be able to offer more detailed expert knowledge around the special ed process, perhaps meet with parents to help them review and plan for IEP meetings as a, as a confidential independent resource. 
we would be able to occasionally attend. We looked at other um, ombudsman offices in other districts around the country, and they do have the opportunity when they have additional staff to go with parents and assist and be a total neutral, independent partner in, in that process, uh, assisting more with informal resolutions and also making sure that that person can also be out providing uh, educational opportunities for parents. Right now, primarily, our ombudsman office is receiving information from parents, but not able to then go out necessarily and proactively provide workshops or, or uh, educational learning experiences for parents. So that is how we see this position could definitely be an added resource to this. Um, May 9th would be um, co coming up on um, the school board agenda for approval. We would be using the dollars that were the placeholder. Previously, we had a placeholder set aside by this board for the additional hearing office position. And so what we are recommending is using those dollars from that placeholder for this position instead. And so the money you saw on the previous slide that when uh, Ms. Johnson was showing you on the chart, it said fiscal year 19 budget because it's already in the budget. It wouldn't be an additional. It would just need your approval to take it out of placeholder status to apply for this position. I only have one person with questions, so if you have questions, let me know. Um, I'm going to call on Ms. Corbett Sanders. Thank you, and thank you for this um, presentation. I didn't expect it, but it's great. Um, I do have a couple of questions. One, on the, at the April 2nd work session on restraint and seclusion, we already approved this. And so what uh, this board has already approved having an ombudsman for special services. Uh, so we want to make sure that everybody knows this has already been approved if what you're asking for is a separate motion next week on uh, at the board session to re to approve it at the dais we can do that yeah it's the approval of the taking from a placeholder which was held in a placeholder to to be able to use it for this purpose Yes, sir, I understand that. We already approved it, Dr. Duran, but we can okay. go ahead and do that on May 9th. Okay. Um, I would suggest that, um, and I do want to give some very positive feedback that uh, Mr. Perry spoke at SEPTA this week, and I've had a number of people tell me what a great job he did, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking forward to the work of the task force as well as the independent counsel who is doing more than just a legal review, I, I expect, because that's what we were told. He was going to be more than just a legal review. Can you confirm that? Yes. Uh, we met with independent counsel about reviewing our best practices, taking a look at the data. Um, and Mr. Foster, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. That's fine. I just wanted to confirm that that we are going beyond that, and um, so I just want to make sure we everybody knows that. Additionally, um, I am so pleased about the behavioral interventionist. Um, however, I do want to raise the attention of um, my colleagues on the board as well as others that the number one challenge for these children who um, are having disruptive behaviors is actually a communications challenge. So it's more than just behavior management, it's communications. And so there are two other aspects of the communications that I want to urge people to think about as we are looking to um, address the, uh, these challenging behaviors and really um, create a positive climate for all of our students to um, succeed and flourish. And that is um, the use of assistive technologies in communicating as well as speech language pathologist. And ideally having the two working together or being one in the same uh, experts. Uh, and so when we look at this, I would urge that in addition to behavior management um, teachers that we include the speech language pathologist and the assistive um, technology. And we did talk about that on Monday night. Um, so we just want to make sure that it doesn't get lost based on this preliminary list. Any comments? We 
definitely uh, have that note from Monday night, and we will definitely be including that as probably the next steps in terms of as we work with the task force. We imagine that those are two things we've heard from already preliminarily, but we will bring back the recommendations from the task force, and we do anticipate this will be part of that. I'm glad to hear that because there was a little concern when you said that we were only hearing about the behavior management. So uh, fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I have Ms. Hines followed by Ms. keys Kamara. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so on slide three, I'm just looking at the budget implication there on the bottom because the next thing we're going to talk about today is the budget, the FY20 budget, right? right. So it looks like what we're adding is um, 0.6 million in asks on our budget. So we're going to have to figure out what we don't do, right? Okay. And just to connect, remember when we had the amendments lined up, we had everyone costed out on Monday, but we had TBD. Oh. Board members said, Restrain seclusion was an important priority and we wanted to fill in that TBD and update the board so they had a framework for just that missing piece. Right. Um, and then we have all the next steps that you had from Monday night on the budget and we'll be ready to migrate when you're ready from this information to just fill that TBD gap to then discussing all the board amendments and follow on motions as you prioritize those. Right. Numbers. So then this for our FY20 conversation, this is the TVD. It's 0.6 million. That yes. Okay. So just a question about, and, and this gets to what Ms. Corbett Sanders was just saying, the behavior intervention teachers. Um, if I just a brief description of, um, do they kind of parachute in after a problem starts or are they doing some of that proactive preventative work as well? They do a lot of professional development with individual teachers and groups of teachers and administrators, but they do a lot of proactive work with general ed as well as special ed students and they do a lot of shoulder to shoulder modeling for teachers and going in the classrooms and analyzing behaviors needed and having conversations with teachers. So they serve a very large need in the system. Okay, and right now, just for the sake, because I've forgotten, maybe other people have, um, what is our ratio of behavior intervention teachers to um, schools? We have 17 total right now, and they have, an, uh, they could have up to 14 schools. It ranges from 12 to 14 schools. So 17 for 14 each. They each have 14 Correct. schools. Okay. Uh, and, and after this change? Where would we be then? Uh, it, depending on the pyramid, we're looking at a pyramid model, so it would be about, you know, si depending on the size of the pyramid, so it could be eight or nine schools. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, Ms. keys Gamara, followed by Mr. Wilson. Okay, first of all, thank you guys for um, pulling this together since, well, I don't know when we were here, Tuesday. <laughs> Seems like we were here this morning, no. Um, but certainly glad to see it. I always, even though I understand the behavior management teachers and behavior intervention teachers, I kind of just don't like that name uh, because of the connotation that Perhaps the child is misbehaving when in reality we're really trying to understand the neurological makeup of a child and what works for that kid. And so, um, not that you can change it, but I just thought I would give my commentary. Uh, because I, I think it's important to parents. I think that they feel that their kids are labeled unnecessarily, and um, perhaps that's not the most positive thing. Um, I did want to ask more about the pre preventative care. Ms. Hines asked about the, the preventative intervention that can come from this particular measure, and whether we had considered the Handle with Care program. Um, I know back in 2018, um, my colleague, I think, tried to put forth a motion, and I'm not quite sure what happened um, with that. Oh, no, that was on something different. I'm sorry. They, they use the same name. But there's a Handle with Care program I'm sure you're aware of that uh, focuses on not having to use restraint or seclusion, which is certainly where I think we should be going. Um, and so have we had an opportunity to look at being able to move in that direction. I'm still looking for, and I think you said this is coming with the upcoming report. I, don't, I still don't understand the scope of the problem, right? And, and some of our advocates are telling us that it's not just happening in the special education um, uh, environment, but it's happening in the general education as well. And, and so I think you know, what we're talking about is changing a culture. Uh, which is probably going to take more than 17 plus 
what do you have? Eight there. Um, so I, I'd like to see how, you know, you think we can get that done. Special Ed Great Beginnings Program, explain to me how you think that can help. But I'll stop there while I still have 40 seconds of So to um, handle with care, I believe, and I'll look at Mike Bloom and, and Jane Strong over there, it, it is a program used in various counties, and I know Prince William County uses it. I do believe they have a hands-on portion of that program as well. Um, and we could look into more information about that, though. That could be part of the scope of our community task force and one of the uh, areas that we go to visit to see how Prince William County is also using that program. Uh, as far as the Great Beginnings program, I'm going to uh, allow Mike Bloom over there to have a conversation. He spends a lot of time, he and Dr. Strong, uh, working on that program with special ed teachers. Yeah, so this year our structure for Great Beginnings, uh, which is our teacher induction support program, uh, what we've done is we've created a curriculum very specific to support our special education teachers. So we have 10 cohorts that uh, are led by experts in our Office of Special Education. And each month that we meet with the teachers, we build their capacity as new teachers uh, to be able to support the instructional, behavioral, social, emotional needs of their kiddos. And one of the areas of focus is on classroom management uh, and behavior, behavior intervention, sort of the three-tiered support in providing social, emotional, wellness, behavioral support to kids. And so we have many of our behavior intervention teachers that are coming in and leading the cohorts on those evenings where we talk about the relational pieces of healthy communication, healthy relationships, conflict resolution. We do talk to them about classroom management, about procedures, expectations, the importance of sort of that tier one approach to a healthy classroom environment. We talk about relationship building, how as new teachers they can build and strengthen their relationships with their kids. And so we've embedded into these 10 sessions uh, information related to behavior support, everything from just good classroom management to what do you do as a special education teacher if you're experiencing chronic behaviors. Uh, we lead them through, not in real specific uh, training around the functional behavioral assessment and behavior intervention plan process, but we touch on the resources that they have available to them and we provide them with a who to call list. We connect them with central office personnel so that if they are experiencing uh, challenging uh, situations in their classroom, they have resources that they can turn to. So it's been our first year with this new model, it's been extremely effective in providing that. Um, and the additional resources, because these 10 cohorts meet in the evening, uh, we do need monies for stipends for some of our people that are coming in that are on teacher contracts uh, that are providing some of that leadership for those cohorts. And that's just for the, the first year, correct? The great beginnings? That's correct. For teachers that are new to Fairfax County, if they're within zero to three years of teaching experience, we ask them to participate in a cohort as well. Okay. So we're really looking at their first three years for those teachers. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I want to look at, I want to make sure uh, as a next step, I, and I heard you say that, but we might need to write it down in terms of looking at the handle with care as a possible, a possible way of how we address this. And I want to look at the issue of how we can improve retention because this may be, uh -huh. this may be connected to uh, how our special education teachers leave, whether we've considered a project momentum approach to these kinds of issues and finding hot spots with certain schools, and then um, making sure we uh, address tiered discipline uh, for our students in this situation. Do you want any comments from any, just? We did add a special education resource teacher to our Project Momentum teams this year. I actually met with a group today from OSS and DSS um, looking at possible future programming and how we can add to those teams because many of the principals need the support with the special education instruction. And team, you know, if you just want to comment after, we'll, we'll make sure we stop because we definitely want your input is, and, and give us as much information yeah. as you can. Okay, so, yeah. 
Yes, correct. And we have Mr. Wilson followed by Ms. Palchik. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I think I'm just going to follow up quickly on the number of behavior intervention specialists. Are we, is the three up here in addition, there's an amendment actually to add five, so it would be a total of eight. Um, and, and, I, and I'm, I was, is it your view that all eight would be needed? You know, what's your thought on that particular question? Yes, we believe all eight are needed. Okay. Okay, so because because we're we're going to discuss them separately, and I just wanted to make sure that, in your view, the three assumes the five. Right. Yes, and and Mr. Wilson, I'm not sure if you heard, but we have been talking to principals, and the feedback that's consistently coming in is that principals feel we need more behavior intervention teachers to do more uh, timely intervention and prevention. Okay, thank you. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the Ombudsman Office. Um, uh, is the special education specialist, is that the um, assistant ombudsman that's listed in yes. 2019? Okay, so, so that is that same, that's the same person. Yes. Okay. Um, with regards to the 29% uh, special education, do you have the data on what their grade level is, what the disabilities are, what their income levels are, et cetera? We do have grade levels, and um, yes, we have grade levels. I don't know about income level if we have that, but we do that have in our, in our grade report, and on our quarterly reports that we send to the board in the Bray Brand briefings, it does break it down that way so that you can see how many are coming from which different grade level. And, and so how, how does that office come into contact with the special education families? They reach out currently, they reach out to the office primarily via phone, but there's also the opportunity to email. We have a confidential portal. Um, and so those are the three primary ways that they are currently interacting with the parents. Okay, and, and, I, and I think this point that was made earlier about communication, um, it, it, there's sort of, it's, it, it actually sweeps in some different things. I mean, I think sometimes when you're talking about behavior in a classroom, that is communication. That child is communicating in the way they can, um, and it's and it's and so when you're talking about managing behavior, you're really talking about understanding what's being communicated, maybe. Um, the, but another level of communication is with the family, and I think that you know, unfortunately, too often families uh, find themselves in a confrontational uh, situation with the school system about the services that their child is going to receive. So with regards to families that are coming out of the early intervention program uh, at the county level, does the ombudsman often meet with them and say, hey, we're here, we're able to be the, an impartial advocate for you as you're transitioning to your first placement in, in, this, in the system? We envision that's the possibility of having this additional assistant ombudsman to do that. Currently, they do not reach out that way. They have gone out to various groups and parent groups, PTAs, SEPTA, to let them know that they're there. But primarily right now, the way that it works is the parents will contact the ombudsman when they have a need. So I think what I understand your question is, are we being proactive to let them know? And currently, we're not able to do that with this capacity, but moving forward, that's what we're recommending to yeah. this assistant. My hunch is that those, those families that are, are involved in the early intervention are families that are dealing with more significant disabilities. And those are exactly the families who often find themselves in need of uh, some advocacy on their behalf. Their office, too. Uh, and, and so, you know, this is something that I do think we need to sure. look at it. Absolutely. That's all I have. All right. Uh, Ms. Patrick, followed by Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. And, and I appreciate it. I think, and I appreciate the comments from my colleagues. Uh, I think we're getting to a better place, at least for this year. Um, in addition to this, and, and it sounds like a great plan for now, um, I guess a couple questions I have, and I'll ask them. Number one, uh, things I haven't heard yet today. So number one, um, for me, and what I've heard is really important, I think what Mr. Wilson's getting at is um, getting a sense of what materials we're going to produce uh, to be able to share with parents proactively um, so that they know what services are available, that we have them translated, that you know any parents coming into the system, and especially any you know students coming up from pre-K as well or into pre-K, 
um, that it, we're very clear about whether it's the ombudsman, but across the board, what services are there and what to expect, just to really communicate clearly. Um, another thing is support, and I we and, and brought up last week about the assistive technologies, speech and language, right? Communication, number one way to prevent um, behavioral ways of communicating, right? So I guess it's, I think we all want to see um, whether within this budget or, or finding a way that we can um, not wait to the task force uh, to look at a plan to support um, our ATS, our, our speech language pathologist services, et cetera, if there, there's at least a beginning to at least pilot um, additional support. Uh, I'd like to see that. Um, and then um, the other big one for me that I haven't seen yet that I brought up last time is this is really important, but the principal training, the school administrator training, even um, our RAS trainings. I know uh, I spoke to our lead RAS, asked if he'd been invited, if he was planning to attend um, the visits to Grafton and other places, and I know he's very interested. And so, you know, the more we can train our staff who are overseeing and working and supporting um, our, our teachers at every site where we can't, especially can't have the, the BAT support, um, I, I guess I wanna hear about that plan um, and to really work with Dr. Ivy's office um, in doing this. And then um, finally, just if you could give a little more information um, on the task force, how people can get involved, if there's still room, if people want to be part of that task force, um, and will that be including uh, a plan? I think I heard one of my colleagues say, how do we responsibly set up our system to be able to get away from these seclusion practices and limit the restraint as much as possible? So I know, I don't think we're set up, but how do we get set up? All right, thank you. <laughs> So I'm gonna do the best I can to answer all of those questions, Ms. Palchuk. Um, we are looking for additional materials that we can produce for our families. We did have a conversation this week. Some of our concerns have been about uh, those new to special education or the challenges of understanding the special education process. And we're looking at actually developing a video that we hope to translate in multiple languages um, that could provide some basic information. And, and I think, you know, as I'm sitting here thinking, adding the ombudsman information in that video and other resources that parents can reach out to. So uh, we hope to partner with the Parent Resource Center as well. Uh, so your first question, assistive technology, we can certainly look at a plan. You know I will never turn down additional staffing for speech and language in ATS. So appreciate any support that you might offer to us. Um, the principal training, we did do principal training in April at the all-county principals meeting. We do expect, uh, Dr. Brabrand actually laid the expectation out there that we'll be doing additional training in June, and we're talking about what that's going to look like. Um, I, I, one of my thoughts was to, and this is, we had some discussion about this, possibly doing the relational portion of MANT for every single principal and think that that would be beneficial for those who have not had that. So that's a conversation that uh, we're having in, in special services about what that could look like. And visits, uh, certainly I will reach out to our lead Raz to see uh, if he's interested in visiting. We are looking to take task force members on that visit. Um, we had some conversation about how many people to have on that task force for it to be effective. Too many, we didn't want too many or too little. So if there is a particular organization that you think I need to reach out to, um, you're certainly welcome to talk to me or Dr. Brabran or Dr. Duran. For the ATS, are you able to supply a, a recommendation for how to get that started? <laughs> We're still working on the, number of speech and language and ATS next steps, uh, but we are we're looking at additional training that can be provided at the school level and to paraprofessionals. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. McLaughlin followed by Ms. Schultz. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, someone who has uh, promoted and supported and advocated for the Ombudsman's Office, I'm very much supportive of adding in um, a specialist uh, for special education uh, for more than seven and a half years since I've been on this board. 
Uh, I know our school system has wanted to figure out how best to partner with our special education families, but too often we find ourselves at odds between what the system wants to do and what the families want to do. So I can't think of anything better than adding this position. Um, I do have some concerns and wonder if uh, the, there's been a reflection about the fact that of the 322 contacts that so far this year, 94 being special education, knowing how lengthy IEP meetings can be, if we want to build that capacity for that person to accompany families, I think we'd have to figure out what's going to be the triaging effect of saying, is it the ones where we have the IEPs have become really difficult? And so, because there's going to have to be sort of a prioritization uh, because this one person, obviously, once their role is, is understood and appreciated, there's probably going to be a lot of pulling on it. Um, and also, as part of my questions, I would like for staff to help explain maybe what isn't happening with our PSL positions in serving that role, uh, because we might need to look at beyond the special education role in the Ombudsman's office, what can we be doing better to help families who can't get access to just that one person, uh, but feel again that, that we're finding a way to, to get to common ground. Um, the other thing about that position, if you could speak to when my three minutes are up, is uh, uh, it's slated at being uh, $150,000. And then I noticed that our, our BMT positions are at $100,000 each. So if someone can just speak to what are the, what's the training, um, education level and credentials that you're envisioning for this special education specialist, um, just to understand that, that um, salary index of, of $150,000. I know that that's probably the cost, so that's salary plus benefits, but it would just be helpful to know what that person's educational background and training will be. Um, I also appreciate uh, that um, maybe getting a little bit more um, review on what our special education um, specialists within our um, project momentum and our regions, how we're utilizing that. And then finally, in my 13 seconds, I didn't see captured up in, in this restraint and seclusion um, update. Whatever happened to, I had referenced two different agencies that are known as outside consultants on best practice um, for special education, particularly restraint and seclusion. Uh, I'll find the name, but the one woman that I'd met with was named Carol Demas, who's got the Chicago office and the Loudoun County office. I, I would just like to know if we're going to try and reach out to either her or someone like her in the industry, because uh, that's not reflected there. And I, I do think we need to be leaning on Summit. And I know my time is up, but I just want to echo what Ms. Um, Karen Keyes Gamara said. We know in our system we have high, high turnover of our special education teachers, high vacancy. So part of the training and supports for our principals and assistant principals will be how do you actually evaluate special education teachers when you don't have special education training? Because I think that's how we're losing some of our teachers is they're being judged on a paradigm or on a rubric that doesn't apply to what they're supposed to do with lesson planning and behavior, classroom management, things like that. Ms. Schultz, you want me to respond? I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, Ms. Strauss. Sorry. Oh, I think I, I think I, I, I added about response. three or four questions. Sorry. So thank you, Dr. Duran. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so in terms of the role of the assistant ombudsman and their partnership, you hit it on the nail in terms of the PSL. And I'll ask uh, Dr. Strong in a moment. She can comment a little bit more on that. But essentially, what we're vision is that we do partner with the PSL, and we oftentimes, for many of those um, 94 contacts you're referring to, some didn't even know what PSL was or existed. So sometimes it's an education of what that role is and connecting them back with Dr. Strong and her team and letting them know. And many of the times that has been the solution, and parents have appreciated. You know, when you think about a system of our size and, and all the positions, you don't even know what you don't know. So I know many of the cases, it's redirecting them to the right supports. But in some cases, as you said, they have already engaged with the PSL, they have already engaged with the process and are still frustrated or concerned and feeling that they're not being heard. And that is where we would see then them assisting at this next level of going, because one person would not be able to obviously accompany them and be a part of the IEP. That's what we put on the slide, occasional attendance for those situations where the PSL 
and Dr. Strong's office have not been able to resolve. But most of the time, what we've seen thus far in those cases, they have been able to do that. Dr. Strong, if you want to add a little bit more about how the PSL and their role really supports parents, and you can talk about the partnership you've had with the Ombudsman Office already, where we have sent many parents and connected them with your office. I'm glad to address that. Thank you. So uh, Mr. Perry uh, has uh, contacted PSLs directly or myself or others in my team to, um, to either ask questions or uh, seek ways that he can assist the parent caller that he has uh, engaged with. And as uh, you mentioned, usually uh, simply uh, linking the, the PSL which you know that term means procedural support liaison. So that liaison person in that role with the parent has uh, been uh, more than halfway what was needed. And then the PSL helps the parent and the school look at what are the issues and how can we sit down and come to consensus to resolve that and move forward. So that is what uh, the primary role of the PSL is, is to engage with parents and school staff around what are the special education regulations, uh, give training, give support, attend meetings, uh, and then also help with uh, whatever dispute resolution process might be needed next, like mediation or facilitated IEP processes. So that's a short answer of what uh, I hope that's what you needed. Okay. And in terms of the actual position, uh, you're correct. The 150 is the salary and the benefits. And we are looking for someone who has background and expertise in special education. Uh, it's also different um, than the bit, t the bit position because it's 12 months, so the salary is a little higher. In terms of the training, we would make sure that they do receive the ombudsman training. Uh, there is. Um, uh, it's a week-long training that is done by the National Association of Ombudsmen. That's not their exact title, but the national group. And so they would receive that training as well as uh, any additional training and supports working with Dr. Strong because we do see that person having a close link with that office. Well, at that salary, though, even if it's 100000 and then 50000 in benefits and all that, are we requiring at least a master's degree minimum? I mean, I'm trying to get an idea of... No, this is the way we do it, which is we ask our questions, staff responds, and I'm getting a clarifying question to what he responded to. Yes, because I ask for three minutes and then they respond. So they're responding and I just asked a clarifier to his, his question. I can, I can. I would have to check on, I would need to check with HR on what uh, the title of specialist is an actual classification. So I'm not sure if it requires a master's or not. I know it requires at least a bachelor's and having certification, but I'm not sure if it's a master's per se. I would have to check with HR on that. I can get, we can get back. If you want to put that on next steps, we can have that for you in terms of what's required of a specialist position. And I think your last question um, that we did not yet answer was about the two organizations that you referenced. So we, we reviewed all of the organizations that were recommended to us and considered uh, the various organizations in addition to having a conversation with our One Fairfax Executive Committee about what their recommendations were. And uh, I'm certainly happy, happy to reach out. COPA was one of them. And I'll go back into my notes, uh, Ms. McLaughlin, and look at the other two and, and reach out to have a conversation with them. I, I do, maybe Dr. Braver and Dr. Duran and I can discuss just how, how large we want this again and revisit it, but um, I think there were some concerns. All right, thank you. And, and, uh, and just for clarifying, I think the only way we can stay in this three minute time frame, if you do have questions in addition to once the staff provides an answer, we are gonna have to do go backs because that's the best way to keep us on track here. So, um, Ms. Ms. Schultz. So I, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, is there a goal to increase us beyond 93% retention? Yeah, no, I'd like to know. Uh, you're asking for human resources purposes. Right. I, I think, frankly, it depends. Um, it depends on a number of factors. It depends on the position we're talking about. It depends on what we perceive as the quality of the applicants for that position and the performance of those people in those positions. Um, 
So I don't think it would be a blanket statement. I think it would be very position specific. If we have great people in positions who are doing great jobs, I would want that as close, um, I'm close sorry, to hundred percent. You're answering a question which some of us don't know what the question was. I, I'm not I sure. Can I do it? So the, some of this talk was about what we're doing about um, 93 percent retention. Um, Ms. Keys Gamara brought it up earlier on what the what the role is going to be with any of the work that we're doing with retention and. I, I don't know why that was a lead in to something else, and that's my first throwaway question is, is anything that we're doing, you know, because on the one hand, we're going to be recruiting new people, but the question is, are we going to be doing 93% more, I mean, is there a goal beyond 93% retention? I think in certain categories, like our special education, we have a higher we have a lower retention rate than 93%. Okay, that, that, I, that, I, that I completely agree with. Okay, so, so that gets into the discussion then. Right. That's, the, that, that's the leaping right. point of, uh, of hiring some of these more, um, the BIT type stuff. So this is my general thought um, because I, I struggle in that we always tend to grow positions um, because we say we have a need, but we don't, it doesn't go away from any place else. So, you know, um, first we had a SOSA here and a SOSA there, and now we have a SOSA everywhere. Um, we have a SOSA at TJ. I, I mean, I, I, and so, um, in, th this is how the cookie cutter approach starts. And, and, and I'm worried that we grow positions, but don't ever take away from anything else. Where does work come off of somebody else's plate? Um, how how do we direct it or or you know so we had three BITs and now we're gonna have eight BITs and then are we gonna have one for you know I mean what's what's the goal you know at what point because I feel like we're having to have BITs and we're having to have the um, special ed ombudsman um, position because there's a problem there, there, there's a problem. There's a functional problem of parents not being able to get the information that they need at the school level. There's a problem in the IEP process. There's a problem with fidelity. There's, I, I don't know what the issue is, but we're adding people to solve a problem. And the question is, will the problem ever be re resolved? And, and I, so I'm, while you would think that I'm very pro adding the special ed ombudsman, we didn't have any ombudsman, and the whole reason we created the ombudsman was to be a bridge between a family who is struggling to be heard and to get them into the right place and navigate difficult situations. And and I don't know off the top of my head how big the Department of Special Services is, but it's huge. It, that is an enormous part of our division. And to say that we have to hire somebody else because people can't figure out how to work the IEP process because they're struggling within the IEP process means to me that something else is broken and we're solving it by hiring another person. And so I, I'm, I, I, I'm not thrilled with that and then I would like to have an answer about what is the goal on restraint and seclusion? Are, you just, are we gonna just finally say we have a goal that we're gonna end it and this is the date by which we're gonna end it, um, or end it by 90%, and there's gonna be 10% of the cases where we're not, and that, that's the date, and we're gonna to drive to it, and here's the strategic plan to get us there. Because I don't, I don't feel like we're actually talking about what the goal is with regard to that, and, and we're talking around it, and we're not talking to it. So what is the goal with seclusion and restraint? And why are we adding more people when we have, when it's really a professional development issue within the schools um, to say that we've got to hire somebody else to help parents navigate the special education experience? Let me take that, Ms. Schultz, and then if uh, Dr. Duran, Ms. Johnson want to share anything. We want to limit restraint and seclusion. I know some district states have outlawed it. I think we need to be willing with the task force to take a deep dive and become learning partners and find out what that means. I went to a national association. They don't do seclusion and restraint. But what they do do is they have cushions mm -hmm. that people use to put cushions between kids and parents. Well, that's not seclusion and restraint. That, that's still 
some way of limiting control of a child. So the definitions, the terms of what is and what isn't seclusion restraint that Ms. Johnson brought up at the very beginning in April are, are, are really important. We need to learn together and then pick a goal, transparently share it. Um, the other thing I would say, because I know you care much about data, some of our highest needs kids, I, I forget the category, it's level two and cat B, I think, are the highest. We, we've seen, like, I wanna say double the numbers over 10 years. So we've got kids with more significant needs than ever, and we have not done as much as we should have as a division to support and train teachers. The bits, frankly, are part of creating embedded professional development that's going on all the time in the system and not hoping one training when you first come in is going to be good enough. And frankly, it's a little bit like once you're in with those kids, you need somebody coming in, helping you, coaching you. You did that right. You didn't do that right. You're starting to drift. You're losing. Um, you're not building the relational component that you need. Um, that's in the mat piece, or you're not handling this technique right, you're not doing the communication part that Tom said. We can't just put people in the classroom, shut the door, and hope it goes well. And we've not maybe intentionally, but we haven't focused enough on providing those supports so that when I've been in those classrooms, a lot of teachers, this teacher couldn't help with the training I received from my teacher prep program couldn't have stayed in a week. So we've got to build in that embedded professional development. And I think if we do, that's why those principals are talking about the bits. But, but I will tell you this, and this is something where you and I can agree, the answer to everything isn't always more positions. I do agree with that. Some of it is better execution with existing personnel. And I think, I think we're going to take that balance. I think you've just made my point. Why not take $150,000 and have a, a, a enhanced professional development, enhanced training program, and deliver the, the resources to the people in the classrooms rather than have, basically, we're admitting that something's broken. If a, if a parent is so frustrated that they need an ombudsman to access this, well, I'm responding to the superintendent, so I'd prefer not to be cut off. And, and that was a very thorough answer and that's very important for us, that's exactly what we should be discussing, is we, we are at a point where we're talking about adding a position which acknowledges that parents are so frustrated with the system, they need help to navigate the system, take the money, and do the training. So, I, you know, for once, I, I, I agree. And as, if there's any comment from the staff on, on some of the other points. Let me take the other point, though. The ombudsman is a lever to change culture in the system. We've never had one. We got one this year. Right after this crisis hit, and I met with those parents, the first thing off their lips, we need someone in that ombudsman's office that understands special education. I am responding to what the parents in every one of those associations said, and that's why I brought it before you. It's ultimately the board's decision to accept these recommendations or not, but I think the community sees and what we learned when you go to that National Ombudsman's Association, school districts that have created a robust ombudsman office have seen overall complaints go down because the culture changes and principals know I'm going to call the ombudsman. If I can't work it through you, if I can't work it through the PSL, it's going to go to the ombudsman's office. And, and I think it starts to create collaboration and mediation is part of the culture of how we do business and not the adversarial relationship that's defined, unfortunately, sometimes too many of our interactions in Fairfax. All right, thank you. Mr. McElveen, followed by Ms. Hold on, Corbett there were Sanders. Other, I, I had other questions I was waiting for staff to answer. We can't. Well, we, we cannot. We cannot throw this three-minute thing yes, and then we never have. get. We decided on but, it. But the man. problem is, no. is that we don't get answers to the yeah. questions. I asked questions. She's been cutting them off. She has been diligent on this clock. So if you, it doesn't count toward it. And what we will do is, you are now on the go back list. So on my go back list, I get to have them answer the questions that I asked the first time. No. If you have an answer, yes. You said that you had more questions. So I'm sorry, Ms. Schultz. Um, I, 
I was attempting to take notes as you're speaking, and I have, uh, I'm not sure what the question is actually, other than what Dr. Brayburn answered about what is the goal of restraint and seclusion. I heard that parent can't get information. What are we solving? Parents aren't being heard. I'm sorry if I missed the question in there. Well, I was talking about what's going on in the Department of Special Services that um, we, we, don't, we don't have the people that meet the needs there, and why are we not doing professional development there? instead of going to, you know, what, what is happening in DSS? Because really that's where this issue is. And so, you know, it, is, it, is it training in DSS? Is it, is it professional development? Is it, is it enhanced support for teachers? I don't understand. We have, this is where this is housed. And so the answer is just the National Ombudsman's, you know, conference and and then it create that creates the culture that there's all of a sudden going to be compliance. So uh, let me answer as much as I can out of that. DSS is certainly doing a lot, and I'm happy to provide you some information about what each office does as part of their responsibilities. Uh, but just as an example, last year, 2017, our behavior intervention um, team alone did 22,000 over 22,000 student supports. Uh, they conducted over 1,000 professional de development trainings at the school level, and they also did 870 Manton PCM trainings. So there, there is a lot of professional development going on, and that could be at the, at the district level as well as the school level and the individual level for, for teachers. All right, Mr. McElveen. Okay, um, I'm actually glad to, to follow Elizabeth because I think um, where she was taking us was, um, in fact, um, a, a good discussion because I think <clears throat> because we have led ourselves down this path of this $6 million placeholder for staff, it has created the per perverse incentive um, that we be brought more staff as opposed to uh, other things that can enhance this work. So. Um, uh, first of all, you know, I will just echo what I've heard in saying that it's it's very easy to add a position, and it's much harder to make sure that the the system works properly with the folks that we already have in place. Um, and I think the 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 one question I have, and obviously I'll finish my remarks and give you a chance to reply, is that um, you know we have the we have 17 bits currently um, serving 12 to 14 schools each, as we heard. So that means one person gets to once uh, every school once every three weeks, right? Um, and if we add add the additional folks that have been proposed, we'll have one person getting to a school every two weeks. Um, I just don't understand how how that is effective or efficient in any way, and how we could um, how. Uh, if there's not a way we could look at first uh, training folks that are already in the school, whether it's instructional coaches or, um, you know, deans of students um, to, to, to look at these issues. Um, and um, I just don't know if we've even given any thought to that before just continuing down this road where it's gonna be almost impossible for us to get, get folks in every school at a, in a reasonable interval of time. So some of the $300,000 definitely would go to training, and it, it is extremely difficult to get in, uh, the bits in particular, and the, the number of schools that they're in. And they do spend days. It just depends on what the issues are happening in the school. It, it goes to some of what Mr. Wilson spoke about on Monday, about where is the crisis team. They often respond to crises uh, in an, within an hour or a couple hours. Uh, but uh, that, some of that $300,000 for the training would also be the behavior intervention teachers conducting the training and adding more training. So yeah, so just to add on that, so the, the BIT position would also be able to do what you described in terms of supporting the teacher leaders, the deans, you know, the staff, they would help. We need people to help deliver that professional development, and so that's a piece of it. And then you'll see the, the line item underneath that Mr. Johnson referred to training, that would be additional staff or training. So we do view this role as a capacity builder. They obviously can go in if they're there serving 12 to 14 schools and do it, but they do need to build the capacity. And when we also think about the number of new teachers each and every year, we need someone to help provide that professional development for them. So that is why we are recommending these positions in particular as opposed to just any other staff. We agree that just adding staff is not necessarily helpful, but we need staff that are going to help build capacity and support those other staff that we do have. And so I think to, just to take that a step further, um, 
in a perfect world, we would have how many bits? They would be serving how many schools to be an effective and efficient system? One for each would be the perfect world. <laughs> okay, and so if we're, but, but no, it's to, if, if we, let's say we're 10 years from now and we've added several more, but you know, do you think we're ever gonna get to a system where we have that? And if not, what, what is an alternative? No, and, and eventually what we would, I mean, initially we would need like one for each school to develop capacity, but then what you wanna do is build the capacity of people at the school so that over time you don't need to have one per school. You wanna begin, that's, and I think Ms. Keys Gamara, uh, reference the project momentum model and that's exactly what project momentum model is all about we have staff and teams who go into a school build capacity provide support once the school becomes successful they're no longer needed at that school so initially in the short term we would need more but the goal would be for those individuals to build capacity and then not be needed as many okay thanks All right, um, I have a question before we do go back. So it's just on the, the committee, the task force. Um, the, the, the time, f well, first of all, um, how many people do you anticipate to be on it? And um, when can we get that list of people who are, like what's your time favor for having them to accept or decline the role? And um, just, just talk to me a little bit about the scheduling. So you received uh, in the last couple of Bray Brain briefings the list and then the updated list last week, and it's around 12. I don't have the exact number, and we had asked to ask add a principal as well. Um, as far as the timeline, we're looking at sketch. I didn't set a date in my communications with them about the uh, when they're going to respond to me. I've heard back from a handful of them, and I did receive a communication from Fairfax County, the deputy that. Um, we, she would get back to me next week and have uh, individuals get back to me next week. As far as the timing, we do expect to have our first meeting in June. And I think as a task force, initially we had planned to meet four times a year and have individual committee groups that may go out and do other tasks such as visiting, uh, doing research and review, and then we, if we need to add additional time if the task force feels we need to meet more frequently, then we're happy to do that. Thank you. All right, I have go backs now, starting with Ms. Corbett Sanders, followed by Ms. Keys Gamara. And I'll be quick. Uh, just a couple of things. One, uh, I really appreciate Mr. Wilson's initial comments about transitions. I actually think that this is an area that we need to be much more intentful. We need to be intentful not only between the transition from our child fine children who then transition to our pre, to our pre K and uh, the K through 12, but also between years. And so it would be very helpful if um, I don't know if that's the role of the ombudsman that will be working or to provide greater supports for those transitions because that's also the time where the trust is established with family members um, and it's where you establish that initial communications that is so important that will make a child's experience successful in each of our schools. And so if we could um, have some more intentional work on the transition planning, I would very much appreciate it. Um, I do appreciate that's the next step. Yes, please. And then I also would like to see a bit more of an explanation of how we can provide more tiered supports so that it addresses uh, some of the questions that we've had today about, you know, you have the, the bits. Um, but you also have uh, intervention in individual classrooms and at the, um, at the building level. And so really talking a bit more, if we could have um, as part of the work, and I don't know if this is work the task force takes on or your organization takes on, but we really do want to look at using the best um, resources available to us by really broadening the role of that task force to be uh, more comprehensive rather than restrictive. And as you know, I have expressed concerns that four times a year is not sufficient to actually um, deal with the uh, situation we're in now. And so if we have four times between now and the end of the year, I wouldn't even say that's sufficient. So I would expect as a next step a, um, a mission statement for the task force and expected um, goals you know, expected outcomes of the task force and um, the structure. So, and then last but not least, um, the, uh, the training piece and how if we could have a, um, 
a professional development plan to um, once we have our bids, how we would actually roll out what are how we measure the success of that professional development and how we ensure that ongoing professional development takes place. Because what I understand is that many people leave the um, teaching profession for uh, exceptional students with disabilities as well as our IAs because they don't uh, feel supported with professional development. And last but not least, our IAs need to have time built into their schedule where they, where they will be compensated for professional development in this area. And so a next step on that too. Any comments? Responses? Uh, one, one response. Well, two, two, as far as the transition concerned, uh, w there was some information or request in one of the previous next steps, so that information will be coming to you. Uh, as far as tiered systems of support, uh, as I've shared with the board in the past, we are uh, beefing up our multi-tiered systems of support and the fidelity of how that's operated in our system. Again, focusing on the whole child with academics, behavior, and wellness. We're providing additional training. Uh, Dr. Brabrand has set the expectation for principals that they all have an MTSS framework within their schools. And part of that would be having a core team that is reviewing behavior and wellness at each school and looking at the data in order to provide appropriate interventions for students. Yes, and, and the tier one, which is our prevention piece, uh, teaching all students. All right, um, Ms. Keys Gamara, followed by Ms. McLaughlin and Ms. Schultz. Okay, I'll start, for time's sake, I'll start with these things as potential next steps, and then I just want to make a, a statement. I, I'm grateful that we're looking at training. Um, and I'll tell you why in just a little bit. But I also want to look at possibly as a next step whether we can incorporate uh, parent liaisons or train volunteers to people from the community who might be appropriate with permission from family members to support. Um, <clears throat> I, I understand that we're not the only uh, district that has gone through this. I understand that Loudoun County has gone through this. I'd like to, it'd be great if as part of what you guys bring to us, uh, we could know what some of these uh, districts that have faced some of the same kind of concerns that we have, how they have responded. And, and throughout this, I'd like for you to look at the accountability piece. Um, how are we going to measure our success? Um, I do agree with some of the comments of, our, um, of my colleagues being concerned about simply adding, but we do need to be able to look at the metrics. What are we looking for? How do we uh, bring that accountability piece to the board? I actually think that this is extremely important. I have visited a number of these day, um, day schools and I've looked at the difference between those that have received the level of training that they need and those that probably came from um, you know, uh, working at McDonald's or some other places and put in very serious situations. And so I just want to stress to my colleagues that um, the, the, the piece that we're talking about and making sure that we provide the level of professional development for the support is going to relieve the angst of our parents because big deal, it is a big deal when our parents feel as though the people who are working with their kids who have these disabilities or have a different neurological makeup that they have been trained and they are supported. I'm also anticipating that um, this, a, a portion of this is going to be working with families and helping them to understand and implement some of the same skills that are being taught to teachers and administrators that the family can become on the same page. And so I really see this as a partnership and critical. I, I can say in my experience, this training makes the difference. And I have seen the good side and I have seen the bad side and it really can impact how successful a child can be. Um, and as part of the next step that Ms. Corbett Sanders asked for the PD plan, we will certainly outline in the training line, we do have parent liaisons and we do have uh, the opportunity to work with our parent resource center, which does workshops and professional development for parents. And so that is included there in terms of additional funding for that. And so we'll make sure that that's really clearly uh, articulated in the PD plan so that you can see, but that is definitely included in our line item request here. Thank you. 
Uh, Ms. McLaughlin, and then Ms. Schultz. Great, I'll try to better understand our practice, which is I'll ask my question, staff will answer, and then I'll have to take a go back if I need to follow up. So part of my question it does go to the prior question I'd asked. Um, so um, Ms. Johnson, you had mentioned to my request earlier at a previous uh, meeting about COPA and uh, the work that Carol Demas does. Um, when I think about the task force and I think about the goal of the task force, which is that we want to identify what's been working and what's not been working for Fairfax County's public schools. What is the national best practice? Carol Demas's organization, that's what they do at a national level. They go out and they work and advise all over the country on this. So if it's not gonna be Ms. Demas's shop, which, I mean, I've not done the homework or the research, I just became aware that these types of organizations exist. My request to staff and to Dr. Braybrand is, if you do not bring in someone at their caliber and lev level, their level and caliber to help work with the task force, as a board member, I, I just wanna prepare you that the public is going to look at this task force and say, what were you doing in terms of getting to know more and get to know better? So that's my first question, is to, to please provide a little more context for me, because I don't wanna keep making the same request, but I am worried about that. The other thing that was interesting, Dr. Duran, I so appreciate your responses. They're very helpful. Um, one of the things that you had said was that the Ombudsman's Office this year was definitely trying to help families identify and recognize we have these PSLs. So Dr. Brabrand, I would say that's the nugget for me tonight, and I hope is a nugget for you. What is going on in a system, and this is not laying blame on anybody, but it's one of the things we talk about is we've got all these rich resources of support in the school system, and how do we get this out to families? And I would say that if our families don't know about PSLs, then something's happening at the school level with these IEPs that once they get sideways with the family, it is the school system's job to say to the families, we're not coming together on this, so let me make you aware of it. And maybe some schools do, but for the families who don't, that's the nugget to say, where was that? So um, I know, Karen, just uh, stop the clock, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Brayman. Well, one thing I want to say, I, I know we're here for the budget work session, <laughs> and, and, but, but, and it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword, but I gotta be honest. I heard you Monday say this was a priority. We wanted to show you what we've done and preliminarily some budget items that we wanted to have in and not after you go through all that budget work and then come back afterwards. So I'm just, I, I realize for some of you maybe it's, well, gosh, we've spent a whole hour on this, hour and a half. But at the same time, we wanted you to see what we've done as an update and get an idea of what at least tentatively, even though we have a task force and outside investigation of what we want to do to be prepared to hit the ground running for next year. So I appreciate your indulgence for some of you who want to get down to the budget, and we do. We have 600,000 we wanted to add in the TBD. That's still our bottom line as you start to then negotiate that six million. The nugget, a big nugget tonight for me is that I knew who my PSL was when I was a principal, and I knew how to direct parents to it, and my PSL was none other than Teresa Johnson 15 years ago. When you have that report, she knows who I am, I knew who she was, we've gotta make sure that that relationship exists at that level in every single school. So that is the Fairfax, uh, Ms. Karen Corbett Sanders has talked about the Fairfax Promise. We have exemplary practices on every single issue, including this one. We do not have it in every single school. And that is the issue for Fairfax County. It has been the issue, it is the issue now, and it will not be the issue. It will not be the issue when I leave the superintendency. We are going to get excellence in every single classroom, school, region. We're going to do it. I am confident we have the leadership that can do it. We're revamping our professional development and aligning it. We have a strategic plan that has metrics and targets that you agreed to pass that is going to hold people accountable. You can't hold people accountable when you don't have metrics and targets to 
mark them for. You all have taken the bold step to lock in accountability and now we're gonna have to respond and we will. So I appreciate the feedback and I, as far as the task force, we've got to figure it out, 12, 15, can everybody get in? We need to make sure we have diverse viewpoints uh, on the task force. Well, and, it, and if there's, do you have something for that, Dr. Duran? I want to okay. clarify for Ms. McLaughlin because it, maybe it wasn't clear the first time. The task force members, maybe you could think about our skipped, okay? Maybe this might help as an analogy. The task force members that we've reached out to are stakeholders who will be members of the task force. The organizations that you're referencing, like COPA and I forget the others, will be invited to do presentations and to engage with the task force, but won't yes. technically be members of I the task force. I wasn't asking three members. I so, want them to present. And, and I think that's where the, the miscommunication came when we were saying that they were not part of the task force. What we, did, what we meant is they were not actual members. And so, again, you and I serve on SCIP. We're members of SCIP, but there are organizations who come present to us their best practices, their research, their knowledge, and that is how we will be partnering with the organizations that you've indicated, as well as some others that are being brought to our attention. Does that make sense and help clarify? That's I think, awesome. I think we yep. didn't clarify exactly, when we say that's exactly they weren't it. members. Yeah. That's not what we meant by not being a part of it. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna put my next steps in because you get the clock going. Um, so the, my next step requests are to what Karen keys Gamara said, um, metrics. I would like to see some metrics because it's apparently not in our strategic plan on what are our numbers over the last five years and then start going forward of uh, how many times are we you know, needing to utilize our PSLs because our IEP teams are sideways with our families. Because I think a measure of success, Dr. Brabrand, is when we're gonna say that we're, we're finding our families being able to work more um, closely together. So th that was the next step I want to make sure we captured. I have no idea till we get up there if I had one in the first. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right, Ms. Schultz. So I'm, again, I'm perfectly happy to have followed that because that's exactly where I wanted to go. Um, um, Ms. McLaughlin, it, if we have a relatively steady percentage of our population of 14% as students with disabilities. Um, the, the, the question becomes, and, and this is something I have begged for, I don't even know, I think every year I've been on the board on the goal one report, and I think we're finally getting there, Ms. Johnson and I have talked about it, um, uh, on student achievement, uh, uh, the, the proverbial orange line, which is the line at the bottom, which is <laughs> students with, dis with the disabilities, and student achievement doesn't move. And it's because we don't disaggregate the students with disabilities. There are, you know, not all students with disabilities are not progressing. Some are. What uh, Ryan was getting to, which he picked up on for me, is this, I, I, I feel like there has to be planned obsolescence. The, the, you know, we're, we are missing, you know, the economic policy of planned obsolescence. Because what you're saying is, is that so many families are running into so many problems in their IEP process that we have PSLs, and then we add BITs, and then we add an ombudsman um, specialist, and we're adding all of these positions that is not addressing the underlying problem, which is we have a very steady 14% of the population. What's going on that we can't meet? I mean, the way it should work, I think is that it was exactly, I'm sorry, but it was exactly the wrong answer to say that it would be ideal to have you know, BIT in every single school. No, what would be great is, is if we gave the, a, a project momentum type of services to when it's needed and that we train people up and we give them, you know, we create the capacity within the people that are already there, not let's layer on lots of other people in order to do the job of supporting families who feel failed by the IEP process. So it, it, that isn't happening everywhere. I've been in a failed IEP process, um, and I've been in ones that have been a gold standard that I think should be the, the model. But it's a training issue at the building level. And what we're doing is we're creating crutches by which we're gonna say we're gonna embed them. And if we have millions of dollars that we're gonna add in time after time after time, you know what happens to the budget next year? It's millions of dollars bigger. And so I, 
there, uh, there has to be a mindset to say that we're going to have some supports in place, but it's to build capacity, and then you won't need that anymore. That we will have a new tra teacher training program that will make this go away. So uh, that's that's my my statement. I do have um, a, a question, which is. Um, who is on the one Fairfax executive committee and how were those people decided? Um, and on a, on a next step, because this is theoretically um, an IEP, this is really fundamentally an IEP or 504 driven um, process or problem, do we have any kind of report that comes to us? I don't recall seeing one that although the 14% has stayed pretty flat, do, are we tracking the number of IEP meetings that happen in a year? Because not all IEP meetings are, are equal, so I don't know if, if they're categorized as ones that are you know much more difficult, like for a differentiated. So if we could get some kind of feedback as to why, what, what those numbers are for, for IP, whether you, if you can differentiate, like I want the learning differentiated, if you're able to differentiate the type, like, you know, the types of IEP meetings that are happening and get some report back to us. I'm trying to, it's a complicated question. I know, I you know, know. I know. We're, we, and, look, but we've look, got a whole we budget keep, and I know. we've got well, to keep We keep on track. handcuffing ourselves by the way that we schedule our work product. This is when we do our work. We're actually supposed to work and it takes us talking with the staff and getting answers in order to be able to oh, do Elizabeth, the work of this we got it. division. Thank you. The One Fairfax executive leadership team is outlined in the One Fairfax policy, which states that the um, both the county and the school system executive senior leaders are to meet monthly to review the implementation of the One Fairfax policy. So the members of that team are all of the senior leadership on the school system side and on the county side. And how long will those meetings go on? Uh, we meet once a month and we're it's part of the policy directed to continue to over to so in perpetuity as right now as we look at each item and they, they are varied depending upon the topic, but that is how the policy was stated and as adopted by both board, boards. And Ms. Schultz, your question about tracking IEP meetings, we certainly can get data. I need to talk to staff about how we can break that down and what that would look like. You understand what I mean about differentiated, like, you I'm know. thinking, are you, are you looking at, is this an IEP, is this an IEP addendum? Uh, how, or, 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 a, or a complex, I mean, there's complex IEP, there's IEP meetings that take 20 minutes, right. and there's some that take hours. Yeah. And I don't think we can break it down that way, but I'm happy to look at other data for you. So, Ms. Schultz, I really appreciate these very good questions. I would suggest that these are not budget questions, and this is what tonight's session was supposed to be about budget. I am happy to schedule a work session on um, our uh, DSS programs and supports, if I, you I like. I couldn't disagree with you more that the more the more IEP meet, the whole reason we're talking about adding BITs and special eds and all of this, the reason we're adding all of this is because of the complexity that we're being told no, we is in our IEP. That, but it's, it's all the budget. So I, I disagree. I think it is, well, I, I think it's crucial because we're being asked to add positions because whatever our IEP process that we currently have isn't working. So I think asking the underlying question is pretty important. Uh, okay. Um, we have Ms. Evans, and then I have a question, clarifying question from Ms. Schultz's, and then we have to go on to the other portion of the budget. Um, and and I, Ms. Schultz, I agree with you that this is complex and there's a lot of things, but we do have limited time, and, I, and I'm trying to allow us to be, um, and staff, we're all just human, and you know, at some point, our our, our ability to comprehend all of this, comprehend all of this, I can't even speak already, and process it all in an effective way is very much diminished. So, uh, you know, it's going to be nine o'clock soon, and um, I don't see us going much beyond ten. So, um, I think that's when we're going to cut it off at a bit. But we got a whole. Uh, we can have. I, we have another one budget meeting scheduled, and that one's in front of uh, at Luther Jackson. So I don't, I don't know how late we can go, Miss Sanders. And of course, I'll take a pulse of all of you. But Miss Evans, you got the last go back. Uh, well, it's not a go back because I have uh, you spoken. got the well, but, well yeah, um, you haven't spoken my, yet, but you were on the go back list right. because that's where we were. 
so actually, I think you just answered my question. I was concerned that we weren't going to get to the other, because we have a lot to talk about in the budget. And so uh, are, are we only staying on this for now? or? Yeah. Okay. This is ending now okay. after I have a clarifying question. Okay. And well, then, then put me on the, the list as the first person first on the next First person round. on the yeah. other portion. Okay. okay. I have a clarifying fr question for Dr. Duran. This, the, the One Fairfax Executive Committee. Um, who is it specifically? And when was it formed? And I guess the skipped, and the skipped Executive Committee doesn't quite know about that, which is Megan and me. We're not the skip sure. executive committee actually wrote it into the policy and it was created as a result of the adoption of the policy so it's i believe it's the second to last paragraph of the one fairfax policy which states that a team would be created so that that came we created as a result of the adoption of the policy uh, you, uh, it was discussed in skipped i don't know if it was in the executive leadership team but it was in the full skipped when we passed the policy um Maybe, uh, it's been probably, what, two years now that we did that. Uh, that was at the request of um, leadership from the, on the skip. I remember if it was the county leadership or, or the school. Maybe if it wasn't the two of you, I know it was not us, but it was county leadership that requested that that be part and added in. Uh, and so who it is, it's the, the, the senior leadership of both county and the school system. But that was a, an addition added Just into have names, the policy. So I know who it is. Names would be um, well on our side. It would be all of our assistant superintendent the LT um, folks. So it would be Jeff Flattenberg, um, Dr. Nixon, Helen Nixon, myself, Marty Smith, Lee Burden, Mary Beth Loveglass, uh, Teresa Johnson, uh, and then on the county side uh, it would be all their counterparts as well. Uh, Ms. Darnay Colfax. I don't, I'm not sure how this is related to the budget. Could we take this offline and get an answer? We can, okay. but 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 I just you know I, I I felt it relevant being a member on the executive committee of Skipped and not knowing how who it was, where it was ported out from, and I gotcha. just I know to I don't I don't I don't mind the question. Maybe I'm just prolonging this, but I hope we're not going to get off in a conversation. No, about we're not. I just I just right I just kind of wanted to know be, because um, we'll ask that offline. We we do want to know, um, Francisco, who you guys. I can are provide you a out. list of all the names. So oh, and who are you reporting out to? Yeah. Who are you reporting? We're not. We're not necessarily reporting out to anyone. It's. For us to meet in terms of partnership and making sure that the implementation of the policy is occurring. So uh, we have various focus points. So for example, uh, our equity profile that we did on FCPS side, I shared with the, the committee to share an update. So basically we provide updates about work that each respective organization is doing. All right, and where there you. might be something we need to report out on would come to the school board or to, or to um, the county side, but it's not really about reporting out to, it's about making sure that we're working out where those issues are between the two respective bodies around the work that's All right, happening. Thank you, and that came right out of skipped and it was a and, conversation and we'll, we had. Yeah, Megan and I will follow up with you offline. Um, I'm not going to take a break because of the time. Um, if you need to get up from the table, we respect that and understand that. And um, so, uh, Lee, I forget, you, were, you don't re really have any presentations uh, right now. Um, I want to call your attention specifically to the summary of issues and next steps, which um, was in, as, as, as one of the attachments, one of the several attachments. Some of the attachments are the same um, as uh, Monday evening, um, just to have for clarity, but the new one is the, uh, you know, the, the answers to as many of the next steps as they were able to do. And you can see they spent a lot of time and a lot of work and a few days to get this together. So what I'm going to do is I um, will start just with questions um, from the board. Um, you can peruse this while people are asking questions if you haven't already done that. And just so you know, you know, we do have two more budget meetings. One is, um, we have the public hearings May 15th and 16th, uh, May 14th and 15th, excuse me, and then the last budget work session we have is May 16th. So we'll, we'll, we'll push through as long as we can tonight, um, but like I said, I don't know how much uh, energy we have after a certain point in time, and I mean that. So, um, Ms. Evans followed by Ms. Hines. 
Thank you. So I do want to thank you for uh, getting us so much material in such a uh, short, short order. Uh, so this um, uh, was, was very good to have the background that you provided in the next steps. On, on my first round, I'm, I'm going to focus on the staffing formula. And we, we did receive this this afternoon, late this afternoon, and I'm not being critical of that, but I've just been trying to go through it very carefully. And I, I do want to call my colleagues' attention to the actual impact of the staffing formula. Um, my concern, Dr. Braybrand, is that there's very little added to our highest needs schools here. You know, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, well, I, look, I didn't look just at my territory, uh, but, you know, I did look at, at other, other high-need schools as well, but virtually all of, of uh, the schools in Mason District would just stay flat in terms of the teachers. And I would say to my colleagues, if you call that up, the spreadsheet, what you want to look at is the That's apples That's what I was going to ask for. Just please, if you can reference what you're looking at. I'm, because I'm looking so at the materials. spreadsheet that was sent to us at 403, I think it was. And uh, it may be, it may now have been posted. Oh, yeah, uh, Bev is telling me it has been posted, so you can also call it up. Um, it was all posted. In right, it, well, it was initially, I, I couldn't call it up originally, but I believe Bev's now posted it separately. Yes, th this is what I'm referencing here. So uh, we're all going to have to ponder this a little bit more, I think, but what I would call your attention to is if you look at the middle column and you look at the number of teachers that would have been under the old formula and you look at the number of teachers under the new formula, and it's apples to apples because it's the same enrollment, it's the same FRM, it's, you know, it, that isn't varied. You do the comparison. And my, my concern is that most of our high needs schools just stay flat here, and some of them, High Blue Valley loses two teachers in the apples to apples comparison. Groveton loses one, Hutchison loses one, um, Mount Vernon Woods loses one, Coates loses one, Providence loses one. And I don't understand what we're, we're, why we would do this. And if you look at some of our lowest needs schools, um, that's where the, the big additions are. Um, and so this gives me great concern. Um, it really gives me great concern. I, if you look at the green, I believe that is, oh, I'm running out of time, but I, I will ask for clarification. The green is the average class size. All right, then I'm, I'm going to need to go back on this. Any comments, Mr. Smith? So, so what I can say is that the, the impact of these changes is, is less a result of the changes to the staffing standards, and, and the impact that you're seeing is really more closely tied to uh, our class size caps uh, that we have in place where we provide additional staffing when class sizes bump up against a certain number. So what we've merely done with the standards is to provide staffing to schools ahead of time. Um, and so I think that, that a discussion, uh, if there is to be a discussion about uh, the staffing standards that you see here, is that we've merely moved positions to the front of the process and not giving those positions out at the end, uh, but that well, where we see those additional positions being given, those would have been given uh, under the previous standard uh, because of our class size caps that we have. So I guess the, the other question I didn't ask was, do these include uh, positions provided by Title I? So, the position, so this, this is our formula, and so Title I is on top of this? Okay. I do understand that, Mr. Smith, and I, I appreciate that. But if we're going to change the formula, I think we would want to use our resources for our highest needs schools as much as for, for others. This may help the board in one way, because when this plan came to me, the superintendent, and this is the essence of it, and, 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 and Sandy, you're right, on, you're right on the mark. We did not fundamental, fundamentally change the structure of existing school board policies around enriching, giving more to higher FRM schools, 
or changing the class size cap policies that you did. The biggest thing we did was move the staffing to earlier in the staffing process that was being held in reserve until late in August or September and putting it forward. We did a few little tweaks. We moved it from 25 to 20%, which we had tweaked last year when we expanded Project Momentum, and we put a bump in. Alice or Lee will know where it is, somewhere at like 50% or 60%. We added a little bit on the formula, but we fundamentally didn't make major changes to the formula. I, I welcome that discussion. I just, in this change, this was more about when with your existing policies, are we giving out the staffing? Not necessarily changing fundamentally how we distribute the staffing in schools. And in those schools where we did have losses, and Mr. Smith, correct me if I'm wrong, we committed to holding those schools harmless. So I, I, I hear you. Um, and I think I welcome additional discussion. I do think we need to start to peel back all of our formulas and start to put an equity lens. I just, I just didn't, this was the first step in at least putting the staffing that we had closer that we were doing at middle and high and we weren't doing at elementary. So there was the equity play there, but not necessarily the equity of relooking at how we do our formulas. And so frankly, maybe that is one of those next steps. Where do we take this formula now and put a more equity lens, particularly, and Ms. Karen keyes Gamar was just over here just talking to me and one of the discussions that you see down the line is we're recommending raising the uh, Title I cutoff. So if with all these other variables coming into play, where do we want to move our needs-based staffing formulas? But I didn't change policies, fundamentally change any policies without the direction of the board. And, and I appreciate that, Dr. Bray Wren. I would like to have that be a next step for us to look at that more in depth. Specifically, do you want a work session? I think we're going to have to have yeah, one I agree. for something okay. that, I, I'm just, that substantial. Yeah, on yeah, staffing formulas. Yeah. I just want to make sure the ladies, the clerk, our clerks. All right, um, Ms. Hines. Okay, thank you. I did have a question about that same chart, um, this, this one that we're all looking at, right? The next step with the green bar all the way at the, um, at the right. And it looks like when I compare um, you, have, you can compare different things, right? The apples to apples comparison, I think, is supposed to be the ratio, which is what is in the green column all the way on the right. And comparing that to the ratio of FY19 is, to me, interesting, right? Um, so, for example, I look at, you know, Cunning, Cunningham Park Elementary there with 30.6. Well, okay, let's take Dogwood with 76%. Um, for FRM, right? So their uh, race average is 20.5 this year, and then you go all the way over to the corner, all the way over to the green, and it's 19.6. So it's my understanding what you've done in that right-hand green column is the places where it's white is a place where the ratio has actually gone up from what it is this year. And the asterisk means that we're going to try to help those schools out to, to uh, ameliorate that, is that right? Would you mind answering that question? That, that is correct. So we're going to provide a position to those schools out of the staffing reserve to hold them harmless. So this, the schools that are losing a teacher, um, but their ratio is staying the same or going down, that's because they've lost kids. Is that right? That is correct. All right, I still think we do need a deeper look at it. But So my other question is not related to this at all. I wanted to get back to our bottom line conversation a little bit, which is we have added um, 0.6 million, uh, we hope, with the behavior interve intervention teachers, the placeholder, right, for exclusion and restraint is 0 0.6, which puts us up to 6.6. Um, .6. Is that where we are? So we have to find, because we took out the 0.6, for the um, the walls, the movable walls, and we put that in one time spending. Right, Lee, you can give us the update on that, right? What was their original staffing amount? We moved the movable walls to one time funding, and now with the placeholder we added tonight of 0.6. What what's our what's our staffing reserve, and what's the total in front of them in terms of amendments? Uh, we're back to the same number because we subtracted 0.6 for the movable wall <laughs> sensor, okay. and then added 0.6 for um, the rest uh, restraint and seclusion. 
So we have to find 0.6 is what we're saying, right? Okay. So if, that's kind of our bottom line, right? Is that we have to find 0.6, no, <laughs> in this, in order to pay for the behavior intervention teachers. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just asking because, you know, I think we have to start looking at, you know, um, well, I mean, that's one way to look at it, or, or the other way is look at it in totality and figure out, you know, you want to take a little from here, a little from there. I mean, that's yeah. That's what I'm saying. Where yes. are we going to find? Because I would like to support, I would like to fund right. the placeholder for seclusion and restraint, right. so we need so, to find so that somewhere else. I think we're else. saying the same thing. We're just okay. thinking about it in a different okay. way. Okay. All right, Ms. Corbett-Sanders. Thank you, and I'm glad you actually asked that question because there seems to be a misunderstanding that um, when we started this process uh, earlier uh, in January, February timeframe, some people put things forward as proposed amendments. Other people said we needed more information before we could make an amendment, but we still intend to have an amendment in um, for this budget, and so they were a follow-on motion, and so it's this is point six, but not everything that is on here has already been approved by everybody around this table. So I'm going to bring everybody's attention back to um, the document that came out this, this afternoon on uh, responses to different questions. And I'm going to bring people's attention to question number one, which is the multi-year plan for IA salaries. We know that these people are underpaid. We know that some of these people are making less than um, what we call a living wage. But even if we address the living wage, these people's salaries will not be addressed in that. And so we had an agreement to look at um, finding a way at a minimum of getting to 50% of the um, teacher's salaries. And so we have a plan that says that um, at a minimum it will be 8.1 million. I think it probably will be more than that because of some of the language here. Um, but it suggests an initial investment of 2.7 million. I would like to have a conversation with my colleagues about their support of paying people who are working full time and making um, very small salaries that we bring their salaries up to a level that allows them to um, be honored for the work that they're doing in support of some of our most vulnerable students and be able to live in our county as long as they're, you know, and this is a problem. We need to address their salaries. So I guess what Ms. Corbett Sanders is she has on the table a, a question and if colleagues want to speak to her about that, but I, but I think that's what you have to look at. You, we all haven't had the opportunity to go through this 12 page document and are there things in this that we want to add in addition to what's already six, what's already listed at 6.6 .6, and now we're adding another Point six, or we're thinking, I mean, that, well, that was the proposal of the restraint and seclusion discussion. And now, like Ms. Corbett Sanders is saying in the answers to the IA salary adjustments, it's another 2.7. So I don't, it, it, this is new territory for everyone sitting around this table except perhaps Mr. Moon because uh, Ms. Evans. No, 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 no. Mr. Moon and Ms. Strauss, this, and, and meaning that we have the opportunity to, to, we have some funds where we can look at and decide what our priorities are, which is, which is unique. To our, so we're not going to get to that consensus in the next hour. Um, we are going to have to have conversations offline and work together, and we are going to have to have a rich conversation and a robust conversation on May 16th at the at Luther Jackson. But um, I, I think you know Miss Corbett Sanders brings up a point for something that she's specifically advocating for, and we have a detailed answer to that question, and that would add an additional. If we did it this year, it would add an additional 2.7. So, you know, just by these two things alone, you're adding an additional 2.7 and a 0.6. So, you know, we're, we're, we're up to nine. Yeah, okay, yeah, nine, I don't know. 
Go ahead, Dr. Braverman. In the same spirit, and I know, I know we got this to you late, but let's remember this was Monday, it's Thursday. We've had people working round the clock. No, 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 I know, but I just want to repeat. We're, we are working full throttle. We're working full throttle to get this information. There's some things where you asked us to prioritize or more have a critical eye. So if you look on page four, for example, where we talked about request number six was prioritize facilities positions, which are critical and which may be postponed. We have information in there for you about that. So we've got some tools in the responses to help you look at where you may, some of you may want to add things that hadn't been included. Some of you may want to look at some things that we recommended we could maybe do a little bit less with, but still move the bar. Um, so I do think there's, there's a little bit both ways. And then some of the conversations that you all will have with one another can help construct and maybe use the budget tool to put in different numbers and add in and see where you can get to um, some additional help. And I will try to help as we move forward. I know uh, number five was provide guidance, additional guidance. But I think you all need to have some conversations first. And I'll try to help if you can't reach the consensus that you want. But I'd rather be the... Um, the facilitator at the end and let you all do the hard work of really advocating for, and it is a unique opportunity. I do want to emphasize what was said earlier. This is a chance for you to put in where your passions are, where we, you thought in the budget I proposed still fell short. And uh, I think it's still overall a positive good news opportunity to have this experience and hopefully this is what your future experiences around the budget are going to look like in the years ahead. All right. And we'll get better at it too. Mr. Moon. Okay. Uh, obviously, not everybody has had a chance to review all 12 page documents for this work session. And it has a lot of information that's going to take us some time to be able to digest and understand. And also, as you know, already uh, indicated by uh, Chairman Corbett Sanders, that you know, uh, not only just her, but other board members may have some other thoughts in terms of either, uh, you know, taking away, you know, taking, uh, removing from what's been on the table as they were they originally planned on proposing, or pr they proposed, or one might want to add a few more items on the table for, you know, other board members' consideration as well. And I might try to do that. And, and I think for the tonight, since we uh, began at 4.30, you know, most of us were here from 4.30. And, it, and I don't really want to go beyond, too much beyond 10 o'clock. And we have a, a lot of this, a lot of this. I, what I would like to hear from my colleagues is this. You know, if they have some questions regarding in this 12-page document, we can ask clarifying questions rather than having an in-depth discussion from page 1 through 12 because we're not going to be able to finish it. And also, if they have been already thinking about proposing something new, something new, just to put them out on the table rather than, but, 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 hey, let's, Mr. Moon, put it out. Yeah, let's refrain from having, having, having debate about it tonight yeah. because I'm not prepared to do that. So a couple of the items that I have been thinking was, I think this uh, this is just something that I mentioned the last time that you know I may even go beyond fifteen twenty seven on living wage. Uh, I am trying to see whether I can work with Ms. Pelchik because there was a joint motion. Whether there there is a creative way to do it, uh, because you know again again in order to fund something you need to find the revenue source somewhere. Uh, so I, w I would like to have a little more time with uh, Ms. Perch again, maybe having offline conversation with some of the colleagues, whether we can come up with a solution, creative solution for that. Another thing is I had some conversation with my dear colleague from Mason District, uh, who, I, who is you know, concerned about uh, the, a, in many of our poorest schools, especially maybe starting with the middle schools, uh, might be needing some more support for after school activities. And I want to have, you know, I want to engage some other colleagues in that discussion and see uh, whether there is anything we can do, starting from FI20. And if not, 
maybe at least come up with some, you know, some plan on a long term basis, a little longer term basis, so what can we do? But I would love to be able to find uh, at least something we can do for FI, FI 20. But again, you know, you, you know, if you are going to put something out, then you need to find a source of funding. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Could I have one clarifying question on your thing? And this is from my work on the Child Care Advisory Council, Ms. Burden. Isn't the county paying for many of our middle school after school programs? Yes. Yes. Francisco. Yes. Yes. So the county funding. So I, I, I would ask that as a, I guess, Mr. Moon, I think that would be a good budget question to see what the county funds Sure, are. what county is funding. And, and, you know, county would have already made up their budget right, decisions by May. I, yeah, by the time we do this, we have to come up with, we want to do anything addition to that, we need to come up with our own source of revenue to fund it. Yeah, because when I was on the Child Care Advisory Council, that's when the county programs came into being, the after school, middle school programs. And so, that was a good eight or nine years ago. So it those are a couple of things which might require additional revenue. So, I mean, that is, there will be incumbent upon proponent to find the source of funding from my perspective. Okay, well, yeah, we'll talk offline. I just wanted to clarify that just so everybody knew that that is county funded. Um, all right, I have Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, great, thank you. Um, I wanted to say that um, in terms of the uh, requests, uh, the prioritization, uh, trying to see which question it had to do with, um, and I, and I do appreciate staff having given us s all this information on such incredibly short notice. It's uh, number six, prioritize the requested facilities positions, which are critical and which can be postponed. I just sidebarred with um, Mr. Plattenberg just to make sure I wasn't going to say something that was not anything other than helpful because I want to be helpful. And, and here's what I want to say, colleagues. Seven and a half years I've been on the board, I've got schools where we've got the trailer issues like we do all over the county. I've got some schools that are so tiny. The question is, how are, you know, what are we doing to help utilize empty seats and get kids out of trailers? Mr. Plattenberg's shop does not have the bandwidth because he doesn't have enough staff. And there are boundary changes that we all know that we've all been sitting on for five plus years and it's not just because the board was trying to figure out what it wanted to do with boundaries, even the easy administrative ones where there'd be no controversy at all, there's just not the staffing to do it. So I, I would just like to lay my marker on the table that <clears throat> there's a position for one. So Dr. Brabrand, um, I'm saying this is one board member and I hope many more voices will fall into chorus. We may need to revisit with Mr. Mr. Plattenberg before we go into any final decisions, I, I want to see that number go up. And, I, and however you determine operationally, but I, I can't sit by and watch this division anymore abandon opportunities here to fill seats that are inside classrooms and get kids out of trailers. And let me tell you guys, I went and toured Fairfaxville Elementary, which is one of my schools. It is absolutely wonderful, but it says their capacity is gonna be at 78%. They've got six trailers out there and no other room. They are bursting at the seams. So uh, we've got some work to do and we can't ignore it any further. Um, the other thing that hasn't been brought up, and but Mr. Wilson really triggered my memory bank on this one. And I've said this one for years. We have $6 million on the table. And as Mr. Wilson brought up, we have continued to put fees on our families who end up providing so many dollars to support this division. And parking fees is one of them. And I've said for years, Maryland schools charge about $25, $30 a year for the administrative fee piece of it. We're charging over $250 if I'm sure. It's wrong. These are taxpayers, these are their kids, they're saving us money by driving them to school and we're not having to provide the transportation for them. They bring kids and their families and the neighborhoods. So the bottom line is, even if it's cost neutral, I'm tired of putting the parking fees on families and it's a nickel and dime thing. We shouldn't be doing it anymore. And so I'm gonna find out the number and I'm gonna bring that to the next conversation of, do we need to keep doing this? It's just not okay. And now my time's up. All right, Ms. Burden, I, I see a lot of these um, 
conversations my colleagues are having. Can you resend us all the budget tool? Thank you. I don't know if I should do this, but I think I'm going to, just to be. Why not? Why not, right? Even the parking tickets has an equity lens. Parking tickets. It feels like a parking ticket. Parking fees has an equity lens. Because in some schools, there's a greater number of kids that have the capacity to drive cars, pay the fee. And I can't remember what the fee cut is for schools now. Lee, do you know off the top of your head, or Marty, remember in the old days, I, I think it still exists, yeah. that schools get a piece of the fee that returns. Mm -hmm. So 50%. it's 50%. 15, 15. It's 15, five. okay. Five. Okay, it's much smaller now than 15%. But even that 15% is based on how many kids you have who have parking permits. Yeah. And that's given back to the principal to use um, in sort of that material supplies, you know, back to the discussion you were having earlier in something. So those, that's another one of those formulas and fee structures when you put the equity lens on. One, it's a very high amount. Um, I want to tell you, though, that goes back 25 years. I was a brand new teacher. There was a budget, tight budget um, going on. And I bet you Mr. Moon was probably right on the board. And they assessed, because I was a new high school teacher, a $100 parking fee. And now, 25 years later, it's or 250 So, Mr. McElveen. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I wanted to um, first reemphasize what I said the other night, and that is that um, I don't think we need to limit our parameters <clears throat> in anything we do based on what the, what the county has done. Um, frankly, I don't think they should be a model for uh, for us. And um, I appreciate Mr. Moon bringing up the living wage issue, and the um, I, I do I would be supportive of, of efforts that you bring forward to get us closer to to fifteen fifty. Um, obviously, we we might not get all the way there, but the more we can do for the, those um, um, employees, the the better. Um, it's it's in, in the big scheme of thing, it's not it is not a big um, dollar value. Um, in terms of uh, other pieces, uh, I, you know, if we're going to talk about parking fees, we need to talk about APIB fees that were levied. Um, we need to talk about, uh, you know, other fees that are that are in our system. So, I don't know if th this is the year when we can bite off all that. So, but um, anyway, that that is one piece, and you know, I'm still going to be advocating for for. Um, um, the language enhancements that we have in there, we, that it is an equity issue and we need to, to make, make um, movement on that this year. Thank you. Colleagues, um, that's all I have for first go round. And uh, no, okay, Ms. Schultz, I didn't see you, sorry. So. I have you, Ms. Adams. So. Um, some of my colleagues started to go there. Um, I think, I, of course, I wasn't here for the, the creation of this list. Um, I, I don't know why this list, as opposed to everything else that we already know that we need to do. Um, I'm in a do or mitigate mode. Um, if it isn't about academic achievement in the classroom or mitigating whatever is happening, i.e. the restraint and seclusion, I'm not voting for it. I'm just going to tell you. Just because there's stuff that we need to do. I thank Miss um, McLaughlin for bringing up, um, I think it was seven years ago when I did the first uh, uh, trailer calculation. And um, I still remember to this day, it was 6,120 seats that we could reclaim if we had gotten rid of um, uh, SAC classrooms and trailers and reclaimed those elementary seats. That's a lot of seats. That's a lot of seats. That's a million, almost a million and a half square feet, right, Mr. Plattenberg? A million and a half square feet of trailers. Um, children are going to school in a tin can out back or out on the side, and I'm not necessarily talking about the quads, but you know what I'm talking about, instead of a brick and mortar school. Thus, I leapfrog to where are the safety and security um, recommendations? We had, you know, $21 million worth of safety and security recommendations. I didn't agree with what you guys did with the expense 
um, out of last year's uh, year-end budget, you spent four and a half million dollars and it was for mental health professionals primarily. We didn't buy a lock, we didn't buy a window, we didn't buy a door, we didn't buy a thing. Not one thing to make our schools more safe and more secure. Yes. It was, it was predominantly mental health professionals with some tabletop training you know, folks. It was nothing, that, we didn't buy a thing to make our schools safer and the kids are still in trailers. So in the, in the question about priorities, I feel like a little bit this thing that was created, it's nice, but it's sort of a discussion about philosophy of spending if you have all the money in the world and it's $6 million. And we have, you know, partitions that should have already been done to keep kids safe all year long. They're, they're um, uh, um, uh, any number of various things. So uh, tra trailers, um, fees are certainly things that we levy fees on and then things that we're not even aware that we levy fees on. I have 19 seconds. Why are children buying books? Um, uh, novels. Um, every child in an in English class, everybody's going out and rebuying novels all over again and pushing that on to students. Um, I, I totally disagree on the parking fees that some kids are able to pay more. Those are the parents that are getting no break at all. Um, you're talking about kids where we're uh, underwriting a lot of their cost of their education already in terms of extracurricular fees. And then there are some kids in a school where, you know what, the parents are already double incoming trying to hold on to everything and it's just one more <laughs> fee. So do or mitigate is kind of my first round goal in, in this discussion. And oh, and the app. If I had a wish list thing, if I had one wish list thing, because I think it would help in communication, is rebuild or reacquire the app that we used to have that used to put at parents' fingertips communication information. It's not gone. It sits there. I still use it. I guess it's just not updated. Um, that's okay. Um, Ms. Palchek. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Dr. Brayran wanted to speak to your comments. I just wanted to say, with, with all due respect, Ms. Schultz, I know you were out during that period. We did, in this year's budget, put in a couple of million dollars that had some, some locks. Uh, we, we increased annual training around our tabletop. And we had mental health, and then we hired. Jeff, am I missing anything? No, you were correct. That was the uh, crisis plan training uh, to be done annually at every school. Those were the eight additional security personnel. Okay. Eight personnel. The the yeah the eight personnel. We updated the locks, and eighteen mental health. And eighteen mental health. Thank you. Across the school division, and we had we had discussed that fully um, in one of the work sessions that we had had, and I can provide an update on where we are in a BB. Still, is not the twenty one million dollars that were in the security review. Oh, that's correct. Ms. Palchik. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I appreciate getting a chance to hear where we are, um, and I'll try to ask a, a few questions. So, first of all. Um, Thank you, Mr. Moon. Um, I just want to clarify, and this is why I asked the budget questions of Ms. Burden for the different um, steps for the living wage. I do hope we can get to at least 1550. Can, uh, I guess I'll ask my questions first. Um, if you can clarify for us, Ms. Burden, that going to 1550 would be, I believe, an additional $81,000, and can you also confirm that at that point, the Food and Nutrition Services is also able to um, take in their additional amount without having to increase uh, costs. Yes, you're correct. Uh, going to 1550 is an additional um, $87,000, and uh, Food and Nutrition Services would um, their cost would increase about $514,000, um, which they would be able to handle without having to um, increase meal prices. Okay, thank you. Um, then I have um, a couple of other questions. So regarding my, this is for Mr. Plattenberg, I appreciate um, your giving kind of the critical positions. I'm trying to find areas where it seems like we're gonna have to find some cuts 
So in my amendments, um, I'm trying to find some areas where we can do that, and I really hope we can all be collaborative in that as well. Um, so it looks like for custodial, um, you said that we would be able to go from nine, I know no cuts are good, but to the most critical five positions. Uh, and then for the trades, it looks like you're recommending one, which actually um, is a security position, uh, to Ms. Schultz's question, and the other is the boundary coordinator. Uh, unfortunately, neither, neither of those is a trades position. They are facilities. Um, so Mr. Plattenberg and um, Dr. Brabrand, if you could maybe uh, walk in a minute, walk us through a little bit of what you see as the critical need. I brought these forward after having asked a few questions and where we're hearing from our, our support staff where they're really struggling and where we're going to see a lot of um, retirement soon. And then my other would be for my colleagues. Uh, as a world language teacher, I love world language. Uh, I, do, I do have some questions about the fact that this is very high school focused. Um, I, I would like us to see focus more of that in elementary school. So from what's proposed, maybe just to think about and talk more offline, um, you know, definitely I think the investments on the online campus or that investment is very critical. Um, I'm not sure that we need the two languages at every single academy or that we can even fill those and get students there um, and to get a better understanding of what is the need and, um, for the others on there. So I would like to see maybe there where we can really focus on what's critical for next year. So um, that's all my questions for now. I'm gonna let Mr. Plattenberg take the first one on facilities or Mr. Smith, which, which of you two would like to be the uh, lead? Mr. Smith? So, so we can support the positions that Mr. Plattenberg put forward uh, with regard to the, the trades positions. I know that Ms. Burden and I are working and uh, will be working with uh, Dr. Braybrand in the future. And there were some conversations about this earlier in our, in our discussion around um, the, the possibility of providing staffing standards for our central offices as well. And so if we look at as student enrollment increases that we would also take a look at the, the impact of our most recent reductions to our central office staff and seeing if there are a way to provide additional positions or additional staffing uh, as we see student growth in the system, uh, then we could possibly uh, provide some of those additional positions in the, in the trades areas uh, that Mr. Plattenberg has said that we could do without uh, within this next budget cycle. And if I might add, uh, Ms. Palachik, it, it's because of that, that tenor and sentiment. I mean, uh, you know, we've talked multiple times, and, and here this evening, you know, here we are trying to add 600,000, so 600,000 would have to go. It was in that spirit of cooperation. If we could codify and get the trades personnel that the previous boards had recognized as a result of the Gibson report of being 262 trades people down. Now, what that means, and people talk about impacting instruction, but when you have a problem with a mechanical system or what we had with Chantilly High School this evening that almost prohibited the play from going mm -hmm. on, the plumber that had to respond and had to clear that line in order to get the flow of the water yeah. into that school and at Westfield High School that we had a couple days ago, each and every one of those affect instruction and are critical to our educational process. Now, the board had identified previously when we had the 262, a commitment of a 10-year plan to fund 20 trades people on an annualized basis said over 10 years we'd recover and recoup and then we went into that financial trough so if what mr smith and Ms. burden i commend them for working to come up with a systemic approach to addressing the issue then as a team player i think you know that the most critical pieces that i could have when i'm asked about the 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 ebb and flow and the push and the pull about how we can work together to try and meet the needs of this collective body. Um, with that kind of a commitment, then I'm all in on these two. And the two that I have there, when we talk about cyber issues, the social emotional, the things that have been happening, what happened in a joining school district that was posted on a social network in advance of what actually occurred that next day, that's, this position here is critical. And, and we're talking again, each of the positions that I would bet with you, even the boundary coordinator, each and every one of those impact instruction because of the needs that we have. So 
Um, anyway, I'll be happy to provide additional information if there's more. Yeah, very quickly, I realized uh, I forgot to ask if we could get um, costs to changing it to this and um, even including any apprentices for next year, what would be the most critical? Sorry. Um, the most critical that's provided in the next steps is um, five custodians and then the boundary and the security position. Um, each of those items would cost uh, about $300,000, which uh, ends up with a savings of uh, $200,000 on the custodians and $700,000 on the uh, trades position, so a total of 0.9. Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Um, so this, I think the first question I have is um, really a next step, but I would like to, if, let, or maybe you have this information, but I would like to know, uh, we did institute an activities fee, we did change how uh, students um, are charged for uh, AB and IP test, IB testing. Um, what, order, what were the amounts that we received from those? What was the impact on the number of tests that was taken would also be really useful. And I actually just would reiterate um, what, what, what Ms. McLaughlin said about parking fees. I'd like to know like what, what is the cost to our school system for if we were to you know, dramatically reduce the parking fee, which is a huge burden on some families. And um, so that's, that's, those are the first series of questions. Um, with regards to the data in the chart, it looks like there's projected new FRM numbers in the third column. Um, if you could answer, how is that, how is that projection uh, determined? And it looks like that that new FRM projection actually is part must be part of the um, formula for determining to the teachers. So I'd like to understand that a little better. Uh, in, in the uh, slide that we were just talking about, which included the new positions for trades, uh, it, it references the revised boundary policy. Uh, I'm not sure I remember revising the boundary policy, so um, if there have been revisions, I, I at least need reviews, uh, because I don't recall actually revising our boundary policy. <coughs> uh, and Let's see, on, I think on that same page, um, I actually, the, the trade positions, um, at least from my perspective, I would love to see a commitment as part of that, um, you know, hiring, you know, at least one or two of our graduates who have, have received certifications in the areas that we need. I mean, some of that's the AC1 or, you know, and, and that, that I think should be part of our, you know, if we're gonna add these positions, we need to make a commitment to our students that are pursuing those, those certifications. If I, I'll take, the, I'll take the lead on starting and then Marty, Jeff, maybe even Sloan on a couple. The original proposal, I think Mr. Plattenberg had three apprenticeships. Is that correct? Mr. Pineberg? Out of the original 100 that I requested, I think there were a lot more than that. <laughs> okay, it's 9.30, I just noted the time. But, but the, weren't there some apprenticeships in the, right. So, Mr. Mr. Wilson, that original thinking was, that's a little bit of a lower salary than entry level, but it does let us capture, gives us an opportunity to capture it like we used to do we used to pull in our kids out of those CTE programs and I would love to expand it. So if there's board support, you don't wanna go all the way down, but you wanna keep a few of the trades, I'd love, I mean, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but the apprenticeship piece, it's a lower entry level position. It really lets us target some of our CTE students. And I think there were three, or Mr. Plannenberg can follow up and give you. The activity fee, Mr. Wilson, I want to remind you, I proposed and this board supported and approved last year, in last year's budget this year, the elimination of the activity fee at high school. No longer exists. We did not assess that fee this year. Is that correct, Ms. Burden? Yeah, correct. Okay. Dr. Presidio did an in-depth review in the fall, as I recall, around the f implication of the fees to our uh, IB and AB te testing, and 
I could put that maybe in a Bray Brand briefing, Dr. Presidio. What, do you want to make any comments summary level about that, though, of what Mr. Wilson was asking? Um, just that we've seen a negligible effect, really, at all. And, and just as a reminder that um, students still have the first six exams that are paid for by the, by the county. But if you would like, sir, I could, as a next step, we could provide that information to the board uh, because we, we, we wanted to check that analysis for ourselves to see whether it was having an impact or not. Yeah, I and guess I, I would be interested to know. I mean, I know that there are students who were taking, well, many more than six, and so I'd like to know, did we disincentivize those students? Did we incur, you know, are we seeing more students getting, you know, four or five? Okay. We'll add that as a next step or follow that up as a next step. And in terms of the boundary policy, that was an oversight that there is no revised boundary policy as of yet. We know that we're bringing that language to the board and the board could consider uh, revising the boundary policy. So uh, were the board to do that, then this position would be uh, crucial in ensuring that it was implemented with fidelity. So are we, are we to expect proposed revisions to the boundary policy? Where, where, we are, where we are with the board on that, we had two work sessions and I'm working with the chair and vice chair to have a third follow-up session soon in the next couple of months to see if we can really come to closure on um, either leaving the boundary policy as is or as I would like to do and I propose to you is taking a one fair fax lens to that policy, coming up with consensus on prioritization of those factors when we did that national study and then using that template to then drive additional boundary decisions going forward. Okay, and I, I guess I mean, we're gonna we're gonna not go through the typical governance process and discuss them first in governance. We're just gonna take it on as the board as a whole. We had two work sessions on the boundary policies where we brought um, all of the best practice research, and uh, then we uh, showed the board some different policy uh, prescriptions, and there's not consensus yet, uh, and I think there is was a discussion at the last one that we need at least one more work session from the board to see if there's clarity about how to move forward, and we're willing to do that. We're working with the chair and vice chair about scheduling that at the appropriate time. Okay, thank you. All right, we are at the point where we have go backs. I would like to take a consensus of the board. Do people want to quit? Because the math is not working out for as many people who have go backs and if they want staff to answer questions. So first of all, I want to see is the consensus of the board that we we adjourn this work session at 10. How many people are in favor of adjourning this work session at 10? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so we, so we will adjourn this work session at 10. In order to get that done, I have, um, I, I have, this is what I propose we do, is if you have, feel like there are comments that are crucial, you can make those, but in the three minutes, we're gonna be very strict with the three minutes. If you have questions, please ask them. If you do, if you, um, if we don't get to everyone, then please, we will ask your questions just as we do other budget questions online. Just remember not to respond all. You can follow up individually with people. Um, if you know, you're clarifying questions, um, don't get asked tonight. So we will do a speed round right now. Um, and starting with Ms. Evans, followed by Ms. Hines, followed by Ms. McLaughlin, three minutes. Thank you. Um, I appreciate Mr. Moon raising the um, the equity issue, and uh, again, I appreciate all that Dr. Drawn particularly has has done on this for uh, for the future budget. And I um, I guess we don't have the time tonight, but I would be interested in um, a conversation or a feedback on uh, getting started in this this coming fiscal year. Uh, Mr. Moon and I did have a conversation about the possibility of. Um, adding a, a, a bit of funding for uh, to enhance the, the middle school after school programs, and I, I hear what you're saying, Ms. Darnett Kofax, that, that we uh, this is county funded, but individual schools also do do certain things. They they, for example, might get a bus 
uh, three days a week, and some can't afford that. Some can only afford one day a week, and that that certainly impacts their ability to provide robust after-school programs. So, uh, I'm I'm working with that, and happy to. Uh, continue to work with with Mr. Moon on that. I appreciate him raising that. I don't know what will. It's at this point, it's an idea uh, as opposed to a, a specific proposal. So I would appreciate people's thoughts on that. Um, on the um, did, did um, Ms. Burden was there an answer on the breakdown of the 583 positions um, that are uh, the 20 to 29? I, I I know you only had a couple of days to. To do yeah, it. we're we're still working on that. The 580. Okay, well, actually, oh. if that's that, I, because I've only got so much time. I, I know I am thinking a, about the idea of the our part-time workers. I do want to see how we can move forward with part-time workers, 20 to to 30, basically 30 hours, who don't get benefits. And if there's any, there are 583 of them in the in the division. And if there's anything we could be doing for them. Uh, I support doing something for the IAs. I'm going to have to uh, give more um, more uh, reading of the the specific information that we just received today about that. And um, uh, as far as um, I did have a question about ESOL, the way I'm reading this, the ESOL ratio would go from one per 50 student to one to 75. Okay, I'm getting a nod on that. That gives me some concern about that and. Uh, lastly, just going back to the, the first point, Miss um, Hines, I appreciate you raising the dogwood as an example, but I think that one of the ways to look at that is to say under the current formula, they would get 31 teachers there. Under the new formula, they would get 31 teachers, you know, for, you know, if you're doing apples to apples. So they, they don't lose there, but, but they also don't gain. So, you know, that's one of my concerns. Oh. All right. Oh. Thank, well, no, you, I, you really don't. I we, don't. We, 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 <laughs> oh, we're, we're, I, I was going to My, co my co-pilot here fell asleep yeah. on the job. All right, she's okay. She's doing the best job. Yeah, but, you know, trying to All right, Ms. Hines. Yeah, sure. Just quickly, um, the question of, you know, why these amendments that we've been looking at now for several months. And the, these amendments are on a list because, you know, back in January, we had the opportunity, maybe we thought, to have some extra money to, you know, recover uh, compensation and positions that we have been foregoing for years, you know, for eight years. Every budget we had had that last page in it that said, here's what we're not funding, we're not innovating, we're not funding things that we need. And so this is an opportunity to try to do that. And, you know, some of us had some ideas back in January. I understand new information comes in, new ideas come along, that's great, but we're all going to have to shave in order to get there. And I, for one, am going to have a hard time with m amendments that come in in the last week. I mean, I just don't think that's fair to the process. I never have. So if people have other ideas, I think it's really helpful. We have 21 days and one more work session to go. So I want to see amendments and ideas ASAP. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Ms. McLaughlin, followed by Ms. Schultz. Great. Um, Ms. Hines, I appreciate what you're saying, and I agree. I mean, on on all of it, which is that, uh, yes, uh, when we voted on this in February as an advertised budget to the public and the board of supervisors, we did the best we could with what we had and, and then came forward with ideas. Um, I also believe that, that we do need to give each other time um, to be able to consider anything new that's going to come to the table and why. Um, but I also want to echo something that was said earlier this evening, which is that while I believe every single one of these proposed amendments are with the best of intentions that people are looking at the ways that we can enrich what our school system is, the bottom line is we still know that even our basic needs, our staffing needs that we just talked about earlier today with our Auditor General's report on staffing trades, uh, we are desperately still trying to just get people in our school buildings who serve critical instructional need. And so I, I hope that everybody's going to think very carefully on whatever dollars we're giving. It's, it's thinking about how do we meet those critical needs within the school building. And so uh, with that, I do want to say that I am fully supportive of whatever we can do to address the instructional aid pay. Um, I really want to get a 
um, intensive benchmarking of what our instructional aides are doing. I mean, not just what we think they would be doing, but what they're actually doing, because it's my understanding that we are short-staffed. We sometimes don't even have enough substitutes. They are providing direct instruction, and they're getting paid not at the delivery of the responsibility and the work they're doing, and that's, that's really crucial to me. And uh, secondly, I just want to point out from something earlier that we talked about the other night, and I'm so thankful to Ms. Johnson and Dr. Duran, whoever was behind this proposal, but getting the two school nurses in our community schools as a proposal, it is a delta of $50,000. That's it. But you're taking, instead of having a clinic aide who does not have health care training and being able to put in a registered nurse, which is going to address so many needs in our, in our high poverty schools. But even as we're talking about the vaping and the juuling and the nicotine addictions, that's just another piece that the more we can put a trained healthcare provider in the school to just help with screenings and identif identifying um, these needs, $50,000 difference is gonna have a world of difference in every school where we can start to do it. And so, I mean, I'd love to see with every Title I school we have converting uh, a clinic aid into a school nurse and you know, maybe we build toward it, but uh, I, I wanna make that plug again. I hope everybody is gonna get behind that proposal uh, for our two community schools. I think it will be fantastic um, way to really uh, meet our children's needs. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. And Ms. Schultz, followed by Ms. Corbett Sanders. So can I ask what the cost of the uh, Teach for Tomorrow program was? Do you know that off the top of your head, Lee? Uh, I, I, I don't. I do not. Um, it's usually, though, I, I, again, I'm just brainstorming in my head. It's usually a, a class of it, which is like 0 .17 of staffing, right? Uh, three C high school principal days. So take... Um, uh, Marty, 0.17 of a typical teacher. What what is that again? What's the average teacher thing? You know, what was it? One six of. Yeah, what's 1.7 of a teacher it's salary? Like fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, something? fifteen thousand. I'd call it about fifteen twenty thousand uh, okay, so, per school. So I had mentioned earlier, and now I'm going to make it. A, this would be my official request because this is good for kids and good for for future. Um, I would like to formalize the request that we have a, a trades version of this. Um, when I heard that 40% of our trades personnel are at retirement age within 10 years, we, we have to have, we have to elevate CTE for kids who are not college bound and creating the opportunity that a, a CTE bound kid um, could could go get you know whatever training he needs, apprenticeship or whatever, and then come back and and be within um, our our uh, you know our serving kids in the future. It, it's a it's brilliant. You know it, what it is is it's you're producing you know uh, um, uh, good citizens and productive individuals and creating you know a work path for for kids. So. Um, whatever, uh, if that's a next step of how much that might cost. Um, the second thing is, is that I, I'm very concerned about this boundary coordinator. Um, we haven't, we, I, I don't even actually, I, I don't know exactly where we are. It's been so long since we've talked about it. And the notion that we've got a whole bunch of boundary changes that we're gonna like unleash on the community and we're already talking about hiring somebody to make that happen. I think that's a little bit terrifying. Um, so I don't know where that's going, but I, I don't like the sound of that. And the last thing is, if we're going to do anything, we keep talking about going into the classroom every single year. I just now, just right now, was like buying like 3D cookie cutters for my teacher. Um, teachers need more money to fund their classrooms so that they stop writing, you know, checks out of their own like bank accounts in order to fill their classes. And I, I don't know. I don't know where that's happened. I, again, you know, I feel like every year, and I'm the only person left on this board that has an elementary-aged, you know, student. It is bad. They're struggling, and and they're they're writing, you know, checks, or we're getting it from the parents. So um, I, I don't know what that would cost. I don't even know how. Um, but you know, somehow, if we have some extra. I think I'm worried about this t turning into positions and buying, 
find people because you're building into a budget that already has a structural deficit. You know, so I do think that we ought to consider one-time costs because unless you're going to fire everybody that we hire, you already, if you're building into positions, you're going to you're going to build in more into a structural deficit for next year with an anticipated budget deficit on the county side. And the last thing I'm going to say is, guys, I keep saying there's equity of a different sort. Um, I have a community that doesn't have a school. Um, it doesn't have a school. Um, people are bussed out of, I've got the longest bus rides, I've got some of the most overcrowded classrooms, and if you want to, if you want to be serious that we have one Fairfax, you want to be serious that we have equity, it is only equitable that we, with, um, with resource stewardship, decide that we, that every neighborhood deserves a school. Because right. I've got 40 square miles of Fairfax County that doesn't have a school. That's not equitable. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Mr. McElveen, and Ms. Palchuk, and then we're done. We, oh, do we have next steps? Do we have any? Just want to go back to um, our, the IAs. We have IAs that make less than a living wage today. Um, we really need to take a look at, as uh, Ms. McLaughlin mentioned, the incredible role that they play in our, in our student success. And at the end of the day, this is what we're all about, is ensuring positive outcomes for all of our children. And the roles of our IAs in particular in uh, serving our students, our exceptional students with disabilities, our students that, um, you know, at lower uh, grade levels, kindergarten, um, we have IAs in those classes. And some of these IAs are making um, right around the $15 mark and so we really do need to address this need. I understand the uh, living wage concern, um, but the living wage concern, we're talking about addressing the needs of custodian pay, transportation attendants, food service workers, and those are all very important roles in our organization, but we do need to also address the needs of people in our classrooms. Uh, we, we froze the IA salary of s several years ago when there was a market study and we now realize that, that freezing that salary created inequities in the market. That we're actually paying below market and uh, we need to bring these people in line. And so I'd be looking forward to talking to people about this. I do want to clarify that this was not something that just came um, to the table in the past couple of weeks. I raised this issue, but when I posed the question as a follow-on motion, it was because in January we did not have the level of detail to actually quantify it. And so uh, this is not new, but it is important to um, the people who are playing a critical role in our children's lives. Thank you, Mr. McElveen and Ms. Palchik. Um, so just very quickly following on, on Karen's comments, I know we all received an email from Mimi Dash and Taylor Gaddy today on that issue, and I think um, um, I will certainly be supportive of, of uh, Karen's efforts um, to look to the future in terms of getting IAs to 50% of, of teacher salaries. Um, I did want to um, just clarify on the language proposal. It is for um, two languages at each, cat at each academy. It's not for the, the same language at each academy, and um, it would be spreading those based on need and, um, and student desire. Thank you. Ms. Palchik. Uh, thank you. I have a few questions. I'll ask them and then um, if staff could respond. So the first one following up on um, my previous conversation and then um, where I think I agree with Ms. Schultz on in trying to get some of my apprentice positions back in because there are no trades right now added. Um, my question will be to Mr. Plattenberg, if you could name uh, of those presented the top two to three apprentice positions that are needed and that are aligned to our CTE curriculum and what is the cost per position. Um, my other question is, well, for statement, 100% support uh, and look forward to seeing the proposal for the IA. What it says here, it sounds like it would be about 2.1 million for next year. Uh, so if that's the proposal or if we have a, a separate one, I'm trying to shave from some of my amendments so we can help fund that. Um, when it comes to the living wage, however, it is it would be just $2.87 million um, for getting up to 15 15 an hour. Uh, so it is much smaller. So the living, 0.2. 
point to, did I say that wrong? It's late. Point two eight seven. So it's, I understand we want to do both, and this is quite minuscule compared to what we're looking at at some of our other amendments. So I will be working on that with Mr. Moon. And then regarding that, I guess it's a question as we're amending our amendments. Um, because these are all amendments, if we are, if new amendments are coming or if we're changing some of our amendments, like increasing living wage, I don't say that it's coming from another amendment, correct? That feels no, a little. No, you can just, you can check your amendment off the table and redo it because we're not just in a board meeting. Just redo it. Yeah, okay. just redo it. Just, just revise. Wants to clarify just that. Just revise. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Let yeah. me make it clear. The amendments, we didn't actually adopt any amendments right. Right. back in January. Right. We deferred the discussion until this week so that we would have a more informed discussion. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Last one, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Sorry, I was sidebarring with Mr. Moon there for a second. Um, so just a couple of quick uh, uh, things I'd like to ask. Um, I think we did restore substitute teacher pay to a certain extent, um, uh, but I still think we didn't, we didn't quite restore it, um, especially for those experienced uh, Fairfax County public school teachers. I don't think we quite got back to where they were. Um, and maybe we, maybe we did, and I'm, and I'm just not remembering correctly, but uh, if we haven't, I'd like to see a number um, for what it would cost to fully restore the substitute teacher pay, particularly for uh, the retired teachers from Fairfax County. And then the second thing I would like to see is the numbers to what it, what, what it would cost the system to reduce the parking fee and maybe um, reduce it to say to a $100 figure as opposed to the 300 um, the amount of funding that we, we charge $200 for parking fees and $30 or 15% stays with the school and 170 comes to central office. That 170 uh, annually is about 1.2 million. So if you reduce that down to 100, um, then it would be 600,000. As the substitute pay goes, um, what's included in the budget was um, short-term retiree at 2050, and the rates back in fiscal 16 for a short-term retiree was 2220, so close, but not not exactly. And then on long-term retirees, it was 2645 back in fiscal 16, and then the fiscal 20 is $26, so about a 45 cent difference from that high mark back in 2016. Yeah, if you could work up the, the, the what the expected Take cost it. would be to just uh, restore it fully. All right, I, I, I'm sorry, I let Mr. Wilson speak before staff was able to address Ms. Palchik's questions. Thank you. And then we will go to next steps. So the two priorities, uh, the top priorities would be, and that are aligned by um, having had experience being a CTE member of West Springfield High School back in the day, the two priorities that we have are mechanical and electrical, and they do align with the CTE program, and uh, Dr. Sloan and I had been discussing that. Uh, regarding their actual salaries, I'll look to finance to actually provide that because I think it's uh, Schedule A-7, but I don't know the fully loaded number with um, potential benefits on that. The trades positions that were requested uh, range from 70,000 to uh, 129, and the 129, most of them. They're apprentices, not the. Oh, just the apprentices? Just the apprentices. Oh, yeah, they're all 69,000, including salaries and benefits. Each one is 69 with salaries and benefits. 69,215. Okay, thank you. All right, let's put up the next steps. We'll be glad to cover all the next steps, sight unseen. <laughs> <laughs> if that's okay with the board. How about that? How's that a surprise for the next? I just, have one, I just have one question. My next step from the last time did not actually get answered. I, and, I mean, and I'm very thrilled with all of the answers, but there is still an opacity to um, number 21. And I would like to know why that is. You were going to check 
Well, they're doing that. What I would like at least for board members, I appreciate Dr. Brayrens, but board members, if you can just, if your name is beside it, just see if that's what you want it to. And, and, and if not, maybe what you can do is work so, so we can actually make this 10 o'clock deadline. I don't know why that's, but um, we could. Uh, Slide down just to see if we have any more. No. Okay. So, Tammy, mine. Yeah, well, no, yeah okay. Missing. Let's let, let Dr. Brayran, I feel like some board members just feel like they're, it, it wasn't the, the essence of their idea was not captured. So let's just start from the beginning and we'll just, oh, we'll no. just be. I, it was no, mostly I, tongue in cheek. I know, but we, we but, were. But, but actually, to, to, for the hybrid of what Dr. Brayran said. Yeah, we don't have to vote on that. Only say if it just wasn't right, right. and it's got to be changed. To, we'll do it fast. Exactly. So, Ms. Keys Gamara, one and two and three. One, two, three are okay. Ms. McLaughlin. Yeah, number four just needs to be added. It's the education and job description requirements. Because. All right, Ms. Sanders, Corbett Sanders, sorry. Yes, um, I would say this one is provide more details on or plans for, t for provide plans for offering more tiered systems of support. For our, for our exceptional students with disabilities, including metrics for what are, you know. And then also the next piece is regarding the task force. What is the mission statement? I don't understand, with all due respect, I don't understand how this is budget related. Because I want to know how much it's going to cost. So with all, uh, but that's not a plan. That's not that's not creative. Plans slash costs for offering more t tiered systems of support for our students with disabilities. Okay. And then on the next one, it's regarding the task. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry, Miss um, Be Bev is having trouble hearing. So number five, um, she wanted to add provide plans <laughs> slash costs. In number five, right, right. For offering more tiered systems of support for our students with disabilities, to uh, and then the next piece is a totally different subject, which is um, provide to provide the board with the mission statement for the task force, expected goals and outcomes, and timing. So we're trying to add metrics to what we're trying to do there. Um, similarly, on the next one with the BITs, um, and that's fine. And then uh, build time into the IA schedule, so adding time for professional development because today it's not uh, not built in. They don't have to. Ha they don't have the time, so they need to be paid for it. Um, Next one is provide uh, detail and support for for student transitions, student and family transitions between grade levels. So for example, what, what does what does support mean? Detail and uh, um, basically, today we don't have a consistency in how we deal with the family with the transitions between for example child find to the k6 program from different levels and so what we need to do is have consistency provide detail um, of the supports for students uh, again and i'm just going to ask how does this what does this have to do with budget because there is financial implications of ensuring that we have fidelity of implementation across the system. But I don't feel like the question is being asked in such a way that it is identifying the budget so gap. Like provide like, details of the support and cost requirements or budget implications to ensure that we have fidelity But if, uh, if they don't even know what that gap is, again, I, again, I'm not 
trying this to... This doesn't have to be done okay. in time. Because this was brought to us as part of a budget discussion, Ms. Schultz, and we had a robust discussion about restraint and seclusion, these questions arose from that conversation. Okay. The other piece that is not in, in there is my request for more details on how we are providing speech language uh, pathology support to our students uh, who are having difficulty communicating and therefore presenting difficult behaviors. So how are, do we have, are we using the best practice on ratio? Okay, you got it. Um, Ms. Keys Gamar, 10 and 11 and 12. Put your, put your mic on so she can hear. hear what I have to say? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that has to do with the cost. I think it's a good idea, but, but it also would present a cost, and I'm ass assuming the BIPs would be involved in that. Uh, how this, I, I simply want to know how, what some uh, information we can get from surrounding districts, how will we measure our success, and how will that be reported to the board? And that just has to do with metrics. Well, I, I mean, I used colloquial language there <laughs> on our IEP. We can take out sideways, and we yeah, still understand I, the I essence mean, of what you when want. When, yes. How, we need to use our PSLs when the IEP teams and families are in disagreement. <laughs> Disagreement. Yeah, no, no, that's exactly right. We're not in agreement. Oh, not in agreement. There we go. That's better. Yes. All right. Ms. Schultz. Well, well hang, hang on a second on, on that one. Um, I, I think that makes an assumption, Ms. McLaughlin, uh, that, that the, the PSLs are, are, are coming in. I mean, it can work the other way, you know, um, in, in terms of the, the family members being at odds with the PSLs. I, I was only saying, uh, yeah, this one's a little bit not exactly where. Could we where, just could we just say um, to utilize PSLs to support families and the IP process who need support through the IP process? Well, I don't, yeah. is that what you're getting at? Uh, what I, mean, I, again, I basically was saying that in terms of a metric for us to be seeing where we are as a division and improving our ability to work with our families versus having the difficulty of families. We, we're saying we have to get an ombudsman because families aren't But you know what agreement. I'm saying, that, that it can be the other way around. Just suggest going forward yeah, that I, if, I, if people I just, have complicated right now, we steps, just don't, they send it to the clerk so that we don't have yeah, to do this. Look, I, th I th Dr. Brown, if you think you got you and your team understand where I think going we have the gist of it, and if we have, as, if we need clarity in the next day or two, we can yeah, give you a buzz. You can just email me and yep. say, but it's just yep. trying to get an idea of I, that. I know, measure. I know exactly what you're trying to get at. Ms. Schultz, you're good. Uh, Ms. Evans, okay, Mr. Wilson. Uh, yeah, I think I think this is um, you need to take out the parking piece from this 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 one should just deal with the Changes to the the payment for tests and how that impacted the number of tests taken Ms. Schultz again, and then mr. Wilson. I think it just needs to say with regard to test test fees oh. Test fees charged to students and then I'm fine On mine. Okay, and last one mr. Wilson yeah, and I guess just to add in there, it's not just the substitute pay. I'd also like to um, see it costed out for the, I know I was given it at the table, but to see the cost of reducing the parking fees. 
All right, thank you. Um, thank you, staff. Thank you, board members. Um, I encourage conversation. Um, and uh, Ms. Burden, again, budget tool, that would be great to help us. Thank you all. Good night. This work session is adjourned. <laughs>